I saw a comment today on Instagram that made me laugh, and it was some giant buck, some old lady shot in Texas. I saw a lot. And some guy <laughs> said, if if that deer walked in front of me, I wouldn't shoot it because I'm a meat hunter. I'm like, <laughs> that deer's oh, got plenty of meat. That deer's got plenty of meat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's many times. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Deer Grow. Heck yeah, man. Dude, we put a lot of food in the ground every year, you know, seemingly more and more, and uh, we have a ton of fun with it during the off season. Uh, there's some struggles that come with it too, though, right? Obviously, the back of my truck is evidence, you know, right now, it's mm -hmm. a couple of weeks after uh, I jackknifed, you know, a 4,800 pound uh, material spreader, you know, as I was coming down, and it's just it was too much weight for my truck there. But, you know, all those struggles aside, you know, dude, Deer Grill really has been a staple for our food plotting process uh, for several years now. Yes, we like to put lime and fertilizer on the plots, you know, if we can, but there are some that it's just we're not able to get to them or it's not feasible for us to get out of state with that stuff and so deer grow is kind of the, the quick and easy but still super effective option for us to be able to get the most out of those food plots that we can every year and i mean we're guilty of over analyzing things just like everyone else but that's the best part about deer grow is that it's going to create healthier soils which in turn makes better food plots and the fact is is we can simply spray plot start or plot till when we put the seed in the ground and then when that plant starts to grow we hit it with boost and we know that we walk away when we come back it's going to be a great looking food plot for anybody that's looking to try deer grow if you use the code hunter15 that's h-u-n-t-r-1-5 at checkout for deergrow.com and save 15 percent on any of your deer grow products it's a great way to get started on this and just see what the results are for yourself better food plots bigger deer And we're back. Hey, Hunter Podcast, episode 162, as Nick has to keep us online. Wherever you guys are listening from, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, we appreciate you listening, engaging. Uh, I'd ask you to just take a minute, uh, you know, pause pause the show here or whatever, and give us a follow. Uh, you'll get notifications when we post new stuff, and we, we post new episodes every Tuesday night at 6 p.m. Eastern. Um, we appreciate you guys tuning in, and here we go. Man, we, I want to toot our own horn. We have a line of bangers here coming up. Uh, if you are listening to this, you probably just listened Stacked, to Cr as they say. Chris Brackett's episode. Yeah. Chris freaking Brackett. <laughs> Chris put your bracket. Yeah. Booyah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, throwing throwing Mentos in the air and shooting them. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we kind of, you know, by coincidence, we started building this list of people that we've wanted to talk to for a while. Uh, some of them are newer, which Chris was kind of a newer one for us. Some of them are, man, we got to well, get these guys. You know on. what it is? We're coming off hunting season and people that we've, I mean, been reaching out to for a while. have finally yeah. come, they're com just like us. We're coming out. We're coming, coming out. out of the we're like, oh, hey, what's coming out of the what's going on? In eat the world a little here, bit of so. food, sleep a little bit more, you know? Yeah. So, right. um, today we've got Lee Ellis from, uh, from Sequan mm -hmm. and, uh, same situation, you know, we've just, all of us have been so deep in the deer season and stuff and, and Lee's no different. I know he killed several giants this year as he has for the past several years. So, yeah. <laughs> so we're excited to have him on and we're going to get into, um, you know, I would hope a lot of the, the suburban stuff, which is fairly foreign to us. And mm -hmm. I'm sure, you know, the baiting will come up at some point just because of the, the nature of how those guys hunt, you know, and, and, yep. and what's required in a situation like that. And, uh, excited to get some sp perspective from, from Lee on all the above and, and kind of you know, where they're going with Sequan. I mean, they've, they've branched out quite a bit from the original, you know, just the Atlanta area to, you know, we're seeing them Multiple kill states. big deer in a lot of different states. So yeah. interested to hear about some of that. Well, and I mean, you know, uh, we talk about the content of the hunting industry all the time. I mean, Sequan, THP, these guys are, are kind of the forefront of like what people Pioneers are looking in to. in a d digital space. Yeah. Yeah. And so, Up you today. know, as you kind of see what, what him and Drew are working on, on, on the seek one side, like, you know, what does that look like? What has that journey really been like for them? Because a lot of people don't, especially from a hunting side, don't understand the behind the scenes of like, you know, how Lee and Drew got to even where they're at with the seek one side. Yeah. So hopefully we get into a bunch of that stuff and uh, yeah, be an awesome episode to, to talk with him. We've been meaning to catch up with him for transparently, a and he'll get a kick out of this. We're three hours after <laughs> we had originally set a time for today. He had to update his operating software and download a new his version of Chrome. His computer is and, spot on at this point. He might though. need a new computer here. Well, but, yeah, now hopefully it's fine yeah. moving forward. But. Or it blows up. One of the two. I don't really know yeah. where it's going to go. So anyways, uh, let's bring Lee in. Awesome, man. Appreciate you coming on. Uh, I guess we're now this afternoon. How about that? <laughs> we'll get everything figured out there. Yeah. 
Sorry for the uh, technical difficulty on my end. Apparently, I haven't updated my computer in like five years. So I'm hopeful that afterward, that's going to uh, serve you well. I think your Mac <laughs> operating software was like five or ten years behind is what was keeping you from. Yeah, I mean, three hours to kind of get it updated. Uh, it looks a lot different. So hopefully it'll be quicker. It, it, honestly, like my computer is uh, like I, I had to free up a lot of space because like I didn't realize how many trail cam pictures and videos that I've saved on my computer that has just like bogged the whole system apparently. Mm -hmm. So like I, as I was scrolling through, I was like, I really don't want to delete this trail cam picture. I don't want to delete this one. I don't want to delete that video. And so then I just started deleting like apps that are probably like Microsoft Word gone, like stuff that's probably <laughs> important. Do I need to write yeah. anything? No. Yeah. So it says, uh, it says uh, Google Suite, yeah, gone. <laughs> Microsoft Office Suite, gone. Don't need it. iTunes gone. iTunes is out. So. Uh, well, I hope you didn't delete like, any. I hope you didn't delete any pictures. Those take up the least amount of space. Videos are tough on it, but. Yeah, I did. I didn't delete any trail cam pictures or videos. That yeah. was uh, that was the last thing I was going to do. Microsoft Word trail cam picture delete. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like my old computer. From, and I'm talking about like from college. So mm -hmm. I, I'd have, I don't even know how 10 years ago, 12 years ago, however long that was. Uh, like I, I only keep that computer and it's like, dude, it's a dinosaur of a computer. But the only reason I still have it is to dig back in history and just like look at old trail mm -hmm. cam pictures. Mm -hmm. And I have same with this computer. Like it's literally just thousands and thousands of trail cam pictures. Hmm. Do you still... <laughs> That's kind of a thing of the past for me. Like, I are you still running a bunch of regular cameras and you're saving pictures on your laptop? Uh, no, I don't really have any non-cell cam like picture or uh, cameras I use anymore. But mm -hmm. what I what I try to do is, um, like, if it's a deer that I'm you know trying to keep track of over the years, like I save the pictures in my phone. Yep. And uh, just so that like I'm saving it's almost just data points, you know, like, Oh, he daylighted, daylighted on this day, or he was in this area on this day. And it just sort of like, I'm always trying to like get the clearest picture and like fill in all the gaps of this deer's story, like as best I can. So it's like, I try to store that information. Yeah. Are you doing that you know? mainly in real time? Like that's kind of what we do is when, you know, a picture comes in on a stealth camp, the command app or whatever, we'll screenshot it. Or if I happen to have regular cameras out, when I pull those cards, I'll just take a picture on my phone and because the gallery app on your phone, granted, I'm running an Android, or, but your guys is probably the same. It's it's by date. So I yep. can scroll back mm -hmm. to two years ago and be like, yep, 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 here it is. But yeah. that's not to the level of like Mark Drury also runs almost all cell cameras. But at the end of the season, he pulls all the cards and categorize, or, you know, categorizes and catalogs all of them and makes decisions like almost purely off historical data. With you know, Wild. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm not that organized. Very, yeah, very organized, that. but I've, I've kind of said this in a way that like my, I'm not the smartest guy out there, like admittedly, never, never claimed to be, but it's weird <laughs> the way that my mind works in the sense, it, but I guess the way I describe it is like, uh, you know, you ever heard a song from like 10 years ago, 15 years ago that, that used to be the jam back in the day oh, yeah. and then you haven't heard it in 15 years, but the second it comes on, you still know every single word, mm -hmm. like that's the way my brain works with deer and oh, yeah. like trail cam pictures and stuff is like, Dude. if you ask me to memorize something random, like I'm the last, I'm going to be at the very low end of the spectrum as far as like memorize, you know, yeah. go memorize this set of numbers or just whatever, something not deer related. Yeah. But when it comes to trail cam pictures and stuff, it almost like it goes to a separate part of my brain where it's just like, I remember mm -hmm. every picture every year. I can tell you exactly when it was, where it was like have everything. You, and it's like, have you not heard me say that? 50, exactly. I'm with you. I'm with you, Lee. I've got some sort of selective memory where I'm like most stuff. Like if my wife For tells sure. me something, I'm it's immediately, I forgot it already. But exactly like you're saying, connecting the dots from with deer year to year. Like if a deer would disappear for two, three years and then reappear, like immediately I'd be like, that's a deer. Like I, and they're like, what do you mean? How can you tell them? Just look at it. They can tell. I'm with you. Yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. That's a good like, skill to have as a deer hunter. Jay, yeah. Like Jay, uh, Kendall and Drew, Jay in particular, is he's the one who's kind of giving me a hard time about it. Cause like, you know, he just likes to kill deer and he'll, which we all do. But like, if it's a 140, he'll go, he, you know, 
he'll go hunt it. And, and he'll be like, I don't know what buck it was from last year. It's just a 140. I'm going to go hunt it. Mm-hmm. And I'll be like, no, dude, it's it's this buck. Like you had him on camera last year. You sent it to me, you know, and and he'd be like, he'll go look back or I'll send him his own picture. Yeah. And he'll be like, yeah, you're right. What is that deer? But yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's just, you know, I don't know. It's just a, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a, I'm, I'm, I'm stupid, but not at the same time. Yeah. It's probably autism is the word for it. Like, <laughs> like a, a selective, you know, heightened skill for things that we care about. Yeah. I'm with you. It is weird. I mean, cause we talk about it a lot, Lee, in that, <clears throat> In, in some of it's like family and, and guys maybe that aren't like hunting all the time, but you see a deer and, or you see a deer in a while and you, you're like, it's this deer. And there, that is a skill that a lot of hunters do not have is even with trail cameras, the ability to recognize a deer, like, especially when it's walking in to be like, Oh, it's that deer coming in on me. <laughs> they just can't do it. You know? And I don't know if it's buck fever to where it's like, Oh, big buck and just get worked up or whatever it is. Antlers coming in. But it's really tough for guys to be able to connect those dots to say, especially in the tree stand to be like, it's that deer coming in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's like, uh, I don't know. A lot of people will be like, how do you know it's that deer? I'm just like, dude, I just, I just know. know. I bet. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I can totally relate. Yes. Mm. Uh Uh-oh. Decrease. Yeah. Chris, when calls were coming in, it would freeze them or something. Get to the same behaviors and stuff like, oh, I know this deer somewhere here. You know, it, it, I don't know. It, you just, I don't know. You just know. Yeah. Are you with us in real time now, Lee? You were frozen there for a minute. I, I'm with you now. All right. Yeah, he's good. Cool. Yeah. No, it's, that's a cool skill. It's fine. There for a second. I don't know what that was about. But. Yeah, you did too. It's cool. The way this works is it'll record your side at the highest possible quality. So like, uh, we we can any yeah, of we'll it fixed delays or stuff. But so so Lee, you yeah, you cool. grew up hunting in what Atlanta? I mean, that was or Georgia? Like, I mean, that's where you're born and raised. Kind of where you started this. Yeah, yeah. I'm in Atlanta, and uh, you know, I went to. I mean, my first introduction to like the outdoors was with my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather loved to fish and, uh, you know, whenever we'd go visit him, they're from my side of the family or my dad's side of the family is from like super small town, South Carolina. And so, um, you know, we'd go up there and, uh, visit my grandfather and we'd always go fishing. That was like, you know, I'm like 10, 10, 11 years old. That's like my first kind of step into the outdoors a little bit. Mm-hmm. And so then I came back home and was like, you know, fishing and, uh, just, I mean, became completely obsessed with it. Still am. Um, but you know, probably 14, 15 years old, like just through school, one of, one of my friends obviously was Drew and, uh, like his family had a little farm that they hunted and Drew grew up in hunting family. I had another buddy, Connor. Um, we actually just did a video this year, like going back to when I was 14, uh, when I was 14, for, you know, I'm getting into hunting. It kind of skipped a generation with my dad. Like my dad just, uh, you know, didn't really care for, for hunting and fishing. Um, but I remember for Christmas, I got my first rifle at like 14 years old. It was like a savage 270. Now I think it was like a cup is like literally 250 bucks for like the rifle and the scope. I remember being like super pumped. That was like my first rifle. And then, um, you know, one of my buddies from school at the time, they also had a farm. So it's like, you know, I was going out there and sitting in a, sta- in a, you know, a stand with this rifle. But like, I didn't have anybody teaching me hmm. like anything at all about deer. I literally knew nothing. Like I knew gun safety and, you know, obviously stuff like that. Like I was safe to be going and, and hunting with the rifle and whatnot. But like, as far as what I was doing, I had no, not a clue. No, I didn't even know what a rub was. Didn't know what a scrape was like, you know, just totally blind going into it, which, which was, you know, it's a good and bad thing. Cause like, 
you know, the journey for me is like, it's been a long process mm -hmm. making tons and tons of mistakes early on and, and still do, but you know, it was a good thing. And it like the mistakes and lessons I was learning were firsthand experiences. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, like the learning curve probably could have been cut significantly if I'd have had someone that was like kind of walking me through this stuff a little bit. Sure. So, yeah. Um, you're saying, Lee, a lot of those first so, first experiences were at a farm, like a, a friend's farm? Yeah, it's like, um, you know, South South Georgia. Um, one of the farms was like 600 acres. Mm -hmm. um, and then Drew's family farm I think, was like a couple hundred acres. And it's, it was like east of Atlanta, a couple hours. Yeah. And so that was some so of that your, was, your that first was experience. Like, actually, like in, in the deer woods, they invited you to come out and you're like, yeah, I've, you know, I've got a, I've got a rifle for my birthday or Christmas or whatever, like, let's, yeah, I'll go check it out. Yeah. 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 And then yeah. I so mean, that, my actual first, my no. actual first hunting experiences were not like in Atlanta in the suburbs. Sure. Um, it was, the surface was sort of scratched by going to my buddy's places. Mm -hmm. And then once, you know, Drew and I became super tight and, you know, turned 16 where we could drive and started noticing like, you know, the deer sign around Atlanta, just seeing deer, like driving to school in the morning and stuff like that. It just kind of like opened our eyes to, Hey, we could probably like hunt closer to home. <laughs> and then that's, that's where like, it kind of was, you know, me going off on my embarking on my own journey at that point. Cause I could go do it by myself. It wasn't so much like I had to wait on an invite from a friend to go. Yeah. It was like, I, I, I got free reign here to just go. Yeah. yeah. Well, not only that, but like, I got to uh, imagine some of the deer you guys are hunting in the Atlanta suburbs are way bigger than what most of the state sees like in, uh, in more rural areas. Right. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there, there are definitely like parts of Georgia where there are very big deer, like known for and produce big deer every year. But I think what made Atlanta and Georgia so unique was that like you were seeing these very large caliber bucks, uh, you know, in these, in these Atlanta areas that like people were, were just like, there's no way like that that's coming from Atlanta. There's just no way. That's what I said. Um, mm -hmm. so it's just, yeah, it's just bigger from the rest of the state. So it's kind of like all eyes on Atlanta down here in a sense. I mean, what, what do you think is attributing to that? Because I saw whatever it was early on when you guys were killing some giants, I remember seeing that and being like, um, like what, what in the world? Like those are way bigger than what I think of as a giant Georgia deer. I was like, those, those are giant anywhere. I'm like, what's, you know, how, you know, it makes sense to me from a, a suburban standpoint. I'm like, you, you can go to any suburban area and, and you will see an older age class, you know, just, just because of how they're able to be hunted or not. Mm -hmm. But even compared to like big deer that I know of in, in Georgia, I'm like, dude, those, those are freaking giants. Like how, how's that happening? What do you attribute that to? Well, yeah, I mean, it, I think it's the perfect storm. Like, obviously, age is not the only ingredient that grows big sure. here. It's, it's a big part of it. Um, but there, it was a combination of, of three things, which is food or just nutrition, genetics, and age. And that was all happening in Atlanta. And these deer, I mean, they just have such a perfect environment here. Um, you know, Atlanta's like very wild like there's a lot of wilderness still around atlanta i mean when people think of atlanta they're they're thinking you know city streets and just not vast you know but there's like tons of deer habitat just like intertwined all throughout atlanta mm. um and so you know a big like on the nutrition side and this took us a while to figure out was like kudzu mm -hmm. so in the summertime summer they're eating on kudzu which kudzu is like a it's a it's a vine uh do y'all know what it is I'm yep. talk yeah about it a lot. Yeah, yeah. Yep. it was like introduced to i believe help with erosion on roadways mm -hmm. yeah it's a well, legume it, just like a soybean or anything like that is it an invasive yeah it's, an it's invasive. super high in protein yeah super high in protein yeah, super right. high. and it's like that is their summertime buffet mm -hmm. and it provides them it, like really good habitat, like cover, they can live in the stuff and they're living in a buffet. And so it's like spring, summer, they're hammering kudzu. And that's, what's really growing a lot of big deer. 
Mm. Well, then you transition to the fall. It's like, we have amazing hardwoods here. And the acorn, like this, this year's acorn crop was nuts. Bumper year. I mean, it was, here too. It was insane. I, yeah. I don't know what y'all saw. Yeah. No, it's Our everywhere. acorn crop is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um, so we just have like a lot of vast hardwoods where they're getting a lot of good browse there. And then like when you transition into more like the winter months, when a lot of that has been eaten up, we have a lot of uh, kudzu here. Or no, sorry, not kudzu, privet. Yep. Um, you know what privet bushes are? Yeah, Chinese privet type. Yep. Yeah. So it's like low-lying creek areas are just, it's, it's very dense, brushy. Uh, and it stays green year round and they pile into this privet in the, in the winter months. And then on top of that, they're still funneling into people's <laughs> neighborhoods at night mm-hmm. and pounding their landscaping. You know, they're just getting nutrition, like all, all, uh, all 365 days of the year, they're having plenty of nutrition. Yeah. Whether it's literally people playing stuff in their yard or it's this privet, um, you know, and it's just like, then you, you combine that with the age. And then the other thing too, which was the last ingredient was these deer were imported here. I, and don't quote me on this. I don't know. This is, is like, don't take this literally. I think it was in like the fifties or sixties, um, that they were actually importing deer from like all over. Like, I think I've heard Wisconsin. I yep. think I've heard Texas. Yeah. Mexico. Uh, in, in, yeah, importing them into these areas. And so, you know, you have these like non-native genetics in this area where they're getting tons of nutrition and they're getting the right age. And it's it's literally just like the perfect storm of, you know, ingredients to grow big deer. Wow. I think another big part of that too is when, <clears throat> and again, you got to obviously have the nutrition and stuff there uh, with it. But if you think about, you know, a winter in Atlanta, right? I mean, they're not experiencing nearly as tough a winter as in Ohio or Wisconsin or Michigan deer or yeah, Kansas deer. It's pretty mild, yeah. So, I mean, sure, there's there's limited food and things that... What, what is the climate like down... Like, right now, how cold is it outside? I'm pretty thin blood, <laughs> thin-blooded, like... Well, yeah, but the thermostat's going to say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> what is it, like, 35 down there right now? 40? No, it's probably fifties and it's cold. Like, yeah. To me, that's cold. Oh, wow. It'll probably be like it's 65 cold. or 70 this weekend. Yeah. I mean, the high today is 56. Yeah. And the lows like this week are upper thirties, low forties. I mean, when it gets down like in the twenties at night, like that's, that's cold. Yeah. 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 And, and so it's you... like, if it snows here <laughs> a half inch, a quarter inch, Pretty people serious. like see snowflakes. Yeah. All hell breaks loose in Atlanta. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Just shut down. Yeah. Yeah. So pretty mild winter. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and again, you know, there's a decreasing amount of food, obviously, in the wintertime still. But these other sources, at least talking about there to support that nutrition is is a big part of it. Um, So, yeah, I mean, they just, you know, they've got kind of all these different ingredients that that. I think give well, them the ability. It sounds like it's all kind of right there. So, I mean, do you guys see a lot of, uh, like, dispersal throughout the year? So, have you got kudzu in the summer, you've got the privet in the fall, and you've got the mass crop kind of, your, you know, th- during the fall as well. Do you see, you know, big shifts in terms of, like, you know, food sources changing? Or once you find a deer in an area, like, between a couple wood blocks or whatever, does it seem like they kind of stay put? No, they, they make huge shifts. They do. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've... I've documented with, with obviously with a trail camera, a deer moving, and th- this was in the rut in November. I guess this is just giving a more broad, like, look mm-hmm. at how these deer travel. Uh, seven miles in one night. Wow. wow. From trail Jeez. camera A to trail camera B. That That's the most extreme example I've seen. That's wild. Um, but it's ex- it's extremely normal for these deer to shift their areas. Um when certain food sources change, food sources change, uh, moving two, three miles for them is, is nothing. Wow. Um, there's a buck, I'm, there's a buck I'm hunting now that he's probably, he's probably seven. So he, he's an older age class deer and he will summer in a certain area. And I've had, this this season and the season previous, I've had encounters with this deer at like 35 yards, 30, 35 yards, early season in September, couldn't get a shot. 
And then like shortly after the season opens, he will transition to three miles away. And I just now relocated him again, the three miles away. Wow. And it's, it's because there's, and I've been waiting for him to show up over there. Like, I just, I know that's yeah. just cause I've known this deer for so long. Like he hasn't been there, hasn't been there, hasn't been there. And then boom, he just started showing up and it's because like, it's a, it's an area that has a lot of privet. Mm -hmm. Um, but these deer, I mean, they, they move a lot. It's amazing that, you know, obviously in those high density people area, um, you know, they're so much more vulnerable to a deer vehicle collision, right? With those movements, you know, as compared to a rural area. I mean, Lee, when you, you know, obviously you build history with a lot of these deer, um, you know, Jared and I talk all the time where it's like, man, if, you know, if a deer disappears for a year at some point, we're kind of like, well, he's probably dead. you know, he, he isn't coming back. I mean, do you see these deer being able to, to c- just continue to survive essentially in, in these areas? Um, I'm y- yes and no, like, uh, there before these, uh, these guys started making YouTube videos about suburban hunting. <laughs> freaking just throwing it all I've heard of them yeah uh, <laughs> yeah it was, it was it was mostly just um which we can circle back to that subject at some point but it was mostly just like uh dude, there's there's a thousand ways for deer to die oh in, yeah in these places yep hit by car they get hung up on iron rod fences all the time from people you know them, them jumping fences and stuff and you know, uh, other hunters now, but just like freak accents. I, we had a deer that was 180 plus inches get tangled in a bunch of vines. Um, Hmm. I don't know what kind of vines it was, but, uh, and then like some landscapers, you know, found this deer tangled in a, in a bush and like shot him with his, with their pistol. (laughs) Uh, the deer would have died on its own anyway. Like there's just so many different, different, uh, variables that can, kill a deer here and then i mean take into account the normal stuff which is they kill each other fighting yeah we're just getting sick disease mm-hmm. things like that uh, so you know if a deer has been gone for a year we would pretty much chalk it up that like something has happened mm-hmm. uh but we've also seen where some deer will just like completely change what they do or have typically done in years past and we'll be getting other spots randomly and we'll find them a long ways away and it's like they've reclaimed that area yeah i I don't know if that's like they got lost and (laughs) didn't know how to get home yeah which i don't think is the case or if it's just they just found a better area i would almost think that it you know when we talk about the suburban areas it's i mean think about the habitat loss you guys see on an annual basis from expansion to we're going to put this new strip mall here this new walmart here or whatever you know that might wipe out an entire block that one of these bucks Mm -hmm. are living in they don't have a choice they have to go and find somewhere else yeah the deer uh that i just hunted in or uh just took in ohio um that deer, which I didn't know near as much about that deer as I, I have a lot of other deer that I've hunted. Um, but what I was, what I was able to figure out was this deer was in his summer area. He was actually covering like a pretty, pretty large area. And they put up a, like a big chain link fence. And I, I don't, I think they were trying to keep like homeless activity out of certain areas and it blocked off this deer's main travel route, which mm. was this, this fence went all the way from like a major highway all the way up and into like, you know, a part of the city basically that the deer aren't going to go through. And it completely cut this deer off of his normal travel route. So like he was normally using a lot of this other area in the summertime, but he quit using it because his whole area was cut off. And so he like started hunkering into this, this one main area, but even with, those changes and stuff it's it'll blow your mind how these deer will still find a way to get to where they want to go sure because that deer went four miles away like he knew where he wanted to go and he was gonna get there and i think at night that they'll just like explore like walk that fence until they find a way to get around it or you know or what but it, it it never ceases to amaze me like 
you think that these deer have boundaries like oh they wouldn't cross that highway they wouldn't cross that neighborhood they wouldn't cross all this you know it's development nothing. and it's like it's nothing, nothing yeah dude if you can wrap your head around like under the cover of darkness you know when when we're all sleeping it's like it's like uh it's like that book you ever read the vfg oh yeah you know, it's like when everybody goes to sleep it's like the mm-hmm. witching hours like they all come out it's like they look there's nothing they won't do there's no yeah. highway they won't cross there's no river they won't cross mm-hmm and as surprising as that seven mile number is, and that's even more impressive, like to hear about in a sub- suburban area. Think about if that deer walked a, a seven mile straight line, which you know he didn't. You know, he, he, he uh, zigged and zagged all through it. How many, how many yards? How many driveways? How many, right. how, you know, house windows? He would have had to walk like right next to or on top of, and it's just like. Well, anymore, it, might, it might as well be 30 miles in the Midwest. I mean, well, that's what I was say. Anymore with, with the way that hunting is, I mean, think how many cameras you walk by. That's why I said yeah. when we talk about like, I mean, I, there's very few bucks in that 150 plus class that I think are not yeah. being targeted in the United States. Well, what, just one because thing because of the way that everything's being monitored. Anymore. For sure. Well, one thing that you guys, I assume, have developed over, like, since you guys have been doing Seek One and it, probably even beforehand is. You guys probably have a crazy network of people that you're sharing information with or just, you know, talking to like in the Atlanta area. So even if you're not getting pictures, it's like, you know, hey, dude, we've got whatever, a 50, 100 mile radius of like, uh, you know, p- people we can ask, like, hey, are you seeing this deer? And it's like you can kind of probably figure out where deer are at by talking to people. Yeah, I mean, I, that, that's that been like, uh, you know, like seek one over the years. It's just kind of continuing to like we've just kind of like it's not like upping our game it's just like uh our years have gotten better Mm -hmm. and i mean that that's attributing to a lot of factors obviously like us being able to do this every single day is is the the biggest helps that but like (laughs) as time goes on yeah hey you yeah you might as well seek too right (laughs) you don't want to get greedy but (laughs) (laughs) i know (laughs) but like as time goes on our networks get bigger and yeah it's just like you're yeah. It's casting a large net. Yep. Um, and so it's, uh, but, but at the same time, people are also like, especially around here, real tight lip because, oh, yeah. you know, most deer in Atlanta, like if it's a 150 inch deer in some areas are definitely worse than others. Sometimes there's like 10, 15 guys hunting the same deer mm-hmm. and it's, uh, you know, that you, you that you know about that, probably more than that. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, like that we know about. Yeah. Um, and you would think that like 10, 15 guys hunting a suburban deer, all these ambush points that the, these guys have on these bucks, that they would just be, you know, fish in a barrel in a mm-hmm. sense, like they have no chance of making it. Mm. But that's like, these deer are freaking smart. Yeah. They like, I'll give you an example. There was one deer that, you know, two different buddies of mine sent to me. I knew where the deer was. I chose to not hunt it because I was like, those guys are hunting it. You know, I got my own stuff. Like, I, yeah. I'm not as, uh, I'm not as just like uh, aggressive on that kind of thing as people think. I give away a lot of spots. I let a lot of people hunt my spots. I've walked away from spots because I want someone else to take the deer that's in there. Like, it would mean more to them. Sure. I've done that plenty of times. Um, and that was kind of a situation with this deer. Like friend of friends were sending me a picture of this deer. They're like, Hey, it was in this area. And it was like, you know, I knew of a couple guys that were hunting it. And I was like, I'm not going to jump in the equation of that. Like that's, that's their deal. Like mm-hmm. let them pursue that deer. So this deer is in Atlanta, has a big drop time on one side. And there's several guys that I'm just getting, you know, secondhand information on that are hunting this deer. They all have, you know, feed piles out, and they're all getting pictures of this deer. And you would think that with three, four guys in this deer's area with corn piles, like that they would kill this deer. Deer never, you know, came to any of their corn piles in daylight. None of those guys ever had a chance at that deer. And that deer just knew the deal. Like he just knew the deal, you know? And so that deer ended up getting killed in late November and how we ended up getting killed was a guy got a a place of permission over there. I think it was like five acres or something like that. He didn't put a camera up. He didn't put a corn pile out. He put nothing out. He went in, climbed up in a climber, 
And I think sat one time, saw the buck come through chasing a doe, sat a second time and ended up killing that deer a second sit. And it's like, there's been other guys that have been hunting this deer for, for two, two and a half months at this point, mm-hmm. two months at this point. And it's like some guy stumbles in and, yeah. you know, ends up killing this deer. It, it was almost like he, he, he didn't hunt that much. I think he was pretty new into hunting. Like, I think it was his first deer with a bow Jeez. and it was you know, somewhat beginner's luck. But what had happened was like, he didn't do the corn pile and the camera stuff. He just slipped in and left everything as natural as possible. It. it didn't trick your, trigger any radar senses to that deer and he killed it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so that, that's my the, point in saying that is like, these deer are smart. Absolutely. Well, that's the double edged sword, dude, of like, you know, we, we want to be involved. Like, we want to be hands on with the process. We want to go in and plant food plots. We want to, you know, be in there checking our cameras, hang on our stands. And it's like, you know, we think that all the, the work that we do in the preseason and throughout the season is like, we directly attribute that to like, we hunted this deer and we killed him. Yep. And, undoubtedly there's an element of preparation that pays off, you know, especially when it, for consistency sake. Um, but you have to ask yourself, like, are we doing more harm than good? Because how many, that's the story as old as time. It's like, you know, so-and-so borrowed their cousin's crossbow and I walked out there for the first time and, and killed the deer that nobody's even ever seen in daylight. I think I attribute that the most to the area has been unpressured. They didn't, yeah. did, they didn't do any of the work. They didn't, they weren't in there, you know, uh, messing around or whatever. And the deer just felt comfortable there. So it, man, it almost makes you wonder, like, should I just do nothing? Should I do nothing and just bank on, bank on luck? I'm sure, I'm sure we've <laughs> all seen cases. it. I mean, it, it, there are definitely situations in years Look at this where, potential Ohio record they just killed. Yeah, I mean, did that, nothing. That's exactly, this kid just killed a 235, 240, whatever, giant. We held it here. The biggest deer I've ever seen in my yeah. life. And it, same, he just he waltzed in there to a thir- little 30 acre thicket that just pumped no, up in a climber, borrowed his buddy's crossbow or whatever. And there he came, second set. He was sitting all day, and, like, I'm not discrediting it at all, but, like, that seems to be the recipe for killing the biggest deer in the world. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. It's, it's the total surprise element that yeah. you're throwing at that deer. Yeah. It's yeah. just something they've never seen before. <clears throat> it's something that, you know, they just, nothing triggers their senses and radar of, like, whoa, whoa, whoa this yeah. is different. Yeah. Like, when you go in there sometimes like that, like this guy get did, you know, the beginner's luck just going with a climber. And then the story I just said, it's like, they didn't change a thing. No, they just went in and it was the right place, right time, right spot. And it's like, you change nothing. Mm-hmm. Those deer are just like, you know, you can, that's, that's how you trick them is like the, the least amount of presence possible. Yeah. Uh, I've always said like, and, and this is common knowledge, but your first set's your best set. Sure. And it's because every single time you're educating deer and they're really good at patterning you. Definitely. Like yeah. I've been patterned countless times in Atlanta from, from deer that were just playing the cat and mouse game with me. Yep. And I'm like, for the longest time, I want to sit there and be like, no, it's just, it's just dumb luck. Like these deer are lucky. He's just, it's just, uh, but they know re- after the repetitiveness yeah. Yeah. The repetitiveness, yeah. like every time I'm not there, he'll show up. And every time I'm there, he's not there. It's yep. like, there's something going on. Yeah, Definitely. They know. What, what are the odds and of like watching out. a deer long enough on a consistent, you know, like a bait piles should be consistent. If he's, if he's coming to it and he's comfortable, you're not going in there. He's going to come and you can watch remotely. He's like, he's there, he's there, he's there on the third day you go on and hunt and he's not there. When that happens to you five, six, 10, 15 times over the years, you're like, yeah, no. yeah, the red flag they, is up they at that know point. like he's smelling me and not coming in, or he's seeing me come in from somewhere, and you're, yeah, you can pick up on it. I mean, I think we've all probably done it. I, you know, we talked about it before, but like first hits have been when I kill the majority of my mature bucks. Mm. You know, hang and hunt first hit in an area. Like I've scouted it, I know where I'm going, but like it's it's the first time in there for the season, and yeah, a surprising number. Like for you especially, it's not been the case for me. I I have to work a little harder for mine. It seems like usually <laughs> if it doesn't happen on the first day, then I'm downhill pretty quick. I've probably killed more sitting a spot out, just knowing that eventually he's going to come in, than I have. Uh, I don't know if I've ever killed. Maybe that one I killed in Illinois. Yeah. Well, you know, you know what? That buck I killed in North Dakota and in Illinois were first, first sits in those in spots area. this year. But yep. but but prior to that, yeah, I've had to I've had to work for it pretty hard. But. Yeah, I think it's just you, you <laughs> well, catch them off guard. Hmm. Yeah. This deer that I, I, I've mentioned to y'all that like, is, that I've been pretty obsessed with the last few years, 
I had him at three and a half, four and a half last year. He's 170. This year at five and a half, he's mid 170s. And, you know, he came into the spot, which he typically shows up end of October. He did the same thing, showed up end of October, and he's daylighting. And I go in, first sit, he comes in. Not a care in the world, just didn't end up, getting, end up giving us a shot. And so we, you know, we keep sitting it, keep sitting it. And it's like, we're bumping a couple deer here and there. We're leaving a little more scent in there. And it's like, I hunted that deer all of November and, you know, end of October, all the way through November, beginning of December, never had another chance at that deer. Mm. And what he was doing was, was I can only hunt that. I, well, let me rephrase that. I cannot hunt this area if it's a west wind. Mm -hmm. and that deer will daylight the majority of the time on a west wind. Of course he because does. <laughs> he knows the coast is clear. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I, I cannot hunt west winds, but that is when he is daylighting mm. is a west wind in this place. And it's like, if I'm not playing my winds extremely careful, I'm going to keep pressure in the area yeah. and just keep leaving that presence. And then all of a sudden, like he's nocturnal, he's not showing up as much. And the last few weeks I've laid out of that or a couple of weeks I've laid out of that area heavily. And now he's back to daylighting again, mostly on West winds, but hmm. I've elected to, you know, let the deer try to get to six and a half and yeah. almost kind of revisit like regroup next year and be like, okay, how do how, I've got to go back to the drawing board, how to hunt this deer. Mm -hmm. I've only got one place to hunt. It. Yeah. Dude, that's, so I've got to maximize that little, one on, but that's so awesome to think about a, you know, the fact that these bucks have the cognitive ability to, first of all, per, you know, know what direction the wind is blowing. And like, mm -hmm. I, I assume they have some perception of thermals and stuff too, like the ability to, sure. how, how can I smell the best? It's like, they are smart. Like what you're saying, they will use uh, environmental factors to their advantage. They just have to survive. That's it. That's all they care about right now. Yeah. Especially right now as the rut tails down and stuff, they need to eat to, to build back up. They just need to survive at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm almost like a, this, this buck that I'm telling y'all about, like, you know, normally I get really stressed out about, uh, you know, just the other pressure and like, you know, someone else is going to get him. But like, I, one, I think I've reached a place in my hunting where I'm trying to not get so stressed out anymore. Like Let it ruin just, it for you. It, it, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just like not healthy. Uh, <laughs> but also like I'm playing, you, you would think at this point, like we've got it figured out. We know how to hunt these deer. Like it's automatic. And it's like, no, it's not. We're like, we're still learning stuff every year and we're still sitting there scratching our head every single year. Like, how do we even approach this situation? And so my point in saying that's like, I'm pretty confident the deer's going to make it. And I'm kind of at ease because like he is smart. And if he's behaving this way, yeah. In my area, like he's probably doing the same where he's being hunted in these other places. So yeah. I think the deer's got a really good chance to make it. I'm just going to have to revisit how to hunt him next year if he, if he does make it. Yeah. So how big are, I don't know if you do or not. Obviously, Jeremy and I talk a lot about corn piles, mainly in the state of Ohio. And really, we're talking about rural areas. Um, I said it to you on the phone the other day is I... I I'm way more open minded to it. I think like in an environment where you're at, like in Atlanta, like in a, in a suburban environment, it's just like, it's kind of a, it's a different thing, right? It's like, and I guess this is leading up to a question I'm going to ask you here is like, are you guys hunting deer on natural movements very often? Like we try to do like in, in more rural areas, like you're looking for, you know, pinch points, funnels, downwind uh, bedding, you know, that kind of thing where your guys are at, is it pretty much solely corn piles and like, you know, Hey, he's in this wood block. I got to draw him to like, that's our best shot. I would, well, a couple points. One, I would always, always prefer to not hunt around bait mm -hmm. for the reasons we just discussed is they mm -hmm. just know the deal. Yeah. Right. Uh, and I'm talking specifically about like an older mature buck. So yep. been around the block, I'm not talking about your two, you know, two a two year old, three year old yeah. stuff. I, I hate being around corn piles. Like I, the deer that, you know, every time I'm going in or coming out, there's deer that are being held in that area. Right. And on. you're bumping them, coming in, you're bumping them going out. And I'm like, I, it drives me nuts when I bump deer. Yep. 
It's like, if you're baiting, you're just congregating and holding deer in that place where you're going to be going in and out. You're going to be bumping and pressuring those deer. I would always rather try to be away from it or not around it at all or catching them coming to it. Like I always would try to find the, the element of, give the element of surprise in a sense where it's like, mm -hmm. they're not coming just a straight corn pile where they are going to be, you know, like extremely on edge and stuff. But, um, the, so that's one of it is that like these deer are keen to corn piles. So I always have had more success trying to catch them off of it. Mm -hmm. But two, um, I just, I don't like hunting over bait. Like I just, I just don't, I don't like it. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's kind of a necessary evil around here. Mm -hmm. Uh, because if you're not, if you don't have corn out, someone else is. Sure. Sure. And, well, that's what I was going to ask know, you, Lee. like, if you, if you don't have a corn pot and even <laughs> if you're not hunting it directly, like you're running cameras over it and stuff, will deer even come to those woodlots or are you seeing them pretty much exclusively go from corn pile to corn pile? I mean, it, it depends. Like it depends on the spot because if you have a spot that's like a big enough acreage, uh, you know, you can go get on the white oaks. You can go find some privet. You can go kind of get on there or a scrape line and kind of get on their natural mm -hmm. movements. But a lot of times, like in, in some of the biggest deer I've killed have been on, on breadcrumbs of properties, like really small, tight places. Mm -hmm. And it's just because I've been able to squeeze in and hunt where most nobody has been able to. Right. And like you, you have to have something to draw those deer to that small nook and cranny area. Uh, otherwise it's just not a part of their natural movement at all. So like, you know, in, in, in Georgia, baiting wasn't legal until, I don't know, five years ago. Oh, wow. Five years ago. I, I can't remember. Interesting. I can't remember when it was last year. Um, but you know, the, it was kind of a double-edged sword. The good thing was if you could get the right spot, you're catching deer off guard. They're not on edge. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're relaxed and you can really catch them off guard. Uh, but the other part of it was like a lot of spots that, that without baiting, some of these spots would not be huntable because the deer just wouldn't come there as a part of their natural movement. So it's For like sure. with baiting, you know, you can all of a sudden, all these other properties are, are now affected because you're drawing deer with a bait pile, mm. um, which, which in a lot of these areas is good because like we, sh I shoot all 10 of my doe tags every single year. Mm -hmm. I mean, just it's, it's a given every year I'm going to shoot, I'm going to fill all 10 of my doe tags in Atlanta. And it's because we need deer shot here. Right. And all of those does are coming to feed, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, and that's the most effective way to implement management and shoot deer is to feed late season in the year. Yeah. Um, but I, I mean, the, the gist of it is like, I really don't like hunting around bait. Like it kind of drives me crazy, but it's just a necessary evil. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, I would think so. Like I, I, I've not been to the Atlanta area. I'm not as, you know, familiar with like the, the property size, <clears throat> you know, where we get into, you know, kind of the weeds, frankly, on a conversation is like uh, where small properties surround big properties uh, that may or may not be well managed is like, it takes a lot of uh, the carrying capacity of what that bigger property should hold. And it distributes, distributes it to smaller properties that uh, wouldn't otherwise have, you know, as much natural movement. And I don't, I don't love that situation. That's kind of my beef with, you know, how it's happening in Ohio and stuff right now. But I would imagine in the suburbs of Atlanta and, and probably lots of other, even the Columbus area of Ohio and stuff, it's just like on average, the parcel size is probably just much smaller uh, in general. Like maybe, maybe have a couple bigger blocks here and there, city parks and stuff like that. But um, it, 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 I feel differently about the baiting you know, thing in, in that situation, it, it does seem more like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm probably more okay with it. It's like, yeah, I guess that's, you know, that's how you have to do it. And he's, you're going to pull them out of yards and stuff. Yeah. I mean, but on the other hand, like imagine you're a guy in a suburban area and you have permission on 50 acres Yeah, and it's holding deer. It's got all the right ingredients. And then all of a sudden, like a guy next door on uh, a yeah. quarter of an acre throws out a corn pile. And yeah. It's like all of a sudden the guy who had, you know, Yes. A terrible hunting spot is now, you know, got a great hunting spot. So yep. it's, yep. It, there's, there's give and take to all of it, you know, like, uh, yep. but you know, and, and I'm, I'm not ever going to sit here and say like, I'm ever 
for or against it. I'm kind of like middle ground-ish. Yeah. Where like I understand, you know, the point and you and Jared, you brought up a point like that I never even thought about, which I think you were talking to a lawmaker about Yeah, Mike Rex. Uh, had him mm-hmm. on a couple weeks ago. Yeah. You were telling me that like if baiting was banned, that we would lose a lot of uh, hunter participation. That's right? what yeah. Mike's saying. And I in Ohio, I think that's more because it's always been. Like we've got an entire generation of guys who that's the only way they know how to, you know to hunt. Um, and I do think that if you remove their number one tool that, you know, allows their properties to be effective and, you know, gives them, er, you know, quick and easy success, then yeah, we're, you're going to lose a percentage of hunters by removing that. Um, I, I, and I don't know, I guess that's, it's, it's, uh, one reason I'm interested in the dynamic there in Atlanta is I, I don't know, you know, if at this point after five years they pulled it, um, if that would affect guys that are hunting there or if it would, I, I don't know, it's, it's just an interesting conversation, I guess. Yeah, I, I never really thought about that until you you brought it up. But, um, you know, like I said, I, there, that's a very complex yeah. kind of question and issue. But I, I will say, like, my favorite hunts, and, and here's here's my point. Just because someone baits and shoots a deer over it, I'm the last person on earth that's going to be like, man, that like that's not hunting. Like, shame on you. This, Us that, too. And the other ball Absolutely. Ball. I do understand that mindset though. Like if I lived in a non bait state mm-hmm. and my whole hunting, all everything was, was not involved with baiting. Like I understand that mindset. Uh, but just coming from the South where most of the States are legal to bait, uh, it's just kind of normal here. So I just have a different perspective, but like that being said, some of my most enjoyable hunts have been hunts where I went, I'm not hunting around bait. Mm-hmm, um, you yeah, know, I get in it. States, in state Tennessee, Tennessee, for example, we hunt there. It's a non-bait state. In Kansas, it is a bait state. But the last two years I've hunted Kansas, it has not been around bait. It's just been more spot and stock. Um, you know, just stuff like that has been. Um, I guess as time has gone on, and I've I've been able to like experience enough hunting. Like that's the style I enjoy the most. Is yeah, um, you know, kind of getting away from it. Sure. But, the Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Hoyt Archery. Oh, dude, it's almost fall. You and I are both going to be in a tree stand with brand new Hoyt bows. We're going to be shooting the RX-7 carbon bow this year. I know Hoyt's also got the Venoms out, both equally smooth shooting, quiet bows. Heck yeah, man. And we got a convert on our hands this year. We got a lifelong crossbow guy with a vertical bow in his hands for maybe the first time ever, a good friend of mine. And uh, we've got them all decked out with uh, the inline accessories uh, from the QAD integrated ultra rest uh, to the quiver. And also he's got the SL sidebar mount with a couple of stabilizers from Hoyt as well. So that's going to be a six shooting bow. Yeah. And Hoyt's been cool enough that anyone listening to this can save 20% on any of the soft good apparels online using the code Hunter, H-U-N-T-R, no E. Uh, and if you want to look at the latest lineup of Hoyt bows, check out your local Hoyt dealer. Get serious, get Hoyt. I think one of the biggest things that you guys probably start to experience in these urban areas, especially as more and more people are hunting there, and let's say it is bait legal, is, you know, number one, most people don't know how to hunt a bait pile, right? They just think they have a bait pile out, the deer are just going to come to it, right? Mature buck's still going to be cautious, still going to go downwind, do all the things that we talk about. Plus, the the need or the feeling to constantly be replenishing that bait pile. And the more times, again, we talked about it sure, before, it's work. you're just constantly in and out, in and out, in and out. Like you're, you're training those deer. Mm-hmm. So, you know, even if you're not hunting a bait pile, let's say in the same block, guy B over here is, he's screwing up that entire block by the way that he's either hunting it or how he's putting out corn. I mean, he's trained that buck that you're trying to kill to basically say, I'm not moving toward daylight. Like mm-hmm. I know, like there's no way I'm going over by this corn pile. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an interesting yeah, thing. So. Like, I mean, dude, uh, and we're not going to stick on it here for two because we talk about it yeah. a lot, but we like from an ethical standpoint, uh, I could care less. I literally, I don't care if, you know, if guys want to shoot stuff over bait, you know, great. And admittedly what we, we, do we have and will hunt over bait and like, we feel the same way. Like in Ohio, it's okay. Like, yeah. You kind of, you kind of have to, you know, if you're not, if you don't beat them, join them. I shot two does the other day off a corn pile. I think it's a fantastic management tool. And I had to like, you know, kind of laugh as I was doing that. Cause I passed on the best buck I've ever passed on our farm, walked in and stood at that corn pile for 40 minutes, you know, big four year old broad daylight at like four 30. And I just, I was laughing yeah. to myself about, you know, we get, I, 
unlimited comments of guys that are like, oh, you can't kill a big buck off corn pile. I'm like, well, he's standing right there. So I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, you can if you play it right. I, I mean, I'll say that I've got a unique experience because from Georgia, it was like we hunted not around bait and then boom, all of a sudden we're hunting around bait. And it's like, we had to figure out how to do that because, yeah. you know, some of the biggest deer behind me right now, I killed before baiting was legal in mm -hmm. Georgia. Mm -hmm. So they were not coming to corn piles or nothing like that at all. Mm -hmm. And we were getting good at like, you know, figuring out that rhythm of things. And then I hunted a deer the first year that baiting became legal. I hunted a deer's, uh, it's this deer behind me on my left. I call him lefty. He was 193 inches. And, uh, going into that season, I was like, we can throw out corn. Like this is done. This deer's dead. Yeah, done deal. Like, you know, yeah, it's a done deal. This is going to be a cakewalk. Well, what had ha I had underestimated that deer significantly. And what he was doing was, you know, of course in the summer, I'm carrying in feed to this spot and I'm parking at the same spot. I'm walking in with my feed, I'm dumping it and as I'm leaving. And when I'm gone, he's in there all the time, all the time. So I'm like, this is, this is a done deal. Well, that deer had patterned where I was parking my car and walking in. And so he was bedding in a spot where when I pulled my car in, he would be gone. Mm. Like he knew, he was purposely betting on a hillside right where I was parking my car. And so he knew every single time that I was in there or was not. And I hunted that deer the entire year. I mean, September, October, November, December, and 50 something sits, never had an opportunity at that deer. Hmm. And every single, every single time that I was not in there, it seemed like he was in there daylight, just, you know, just, just, like mocking me in a sense, you know, coming right to the corn. But every time I go in there, he's nowhere to be seen. And so what I fit had figured out was I parked my car one morning and it's like, I opened the door and before I even got out, I heard deer blowing. And I'm like, you know, it's not like I'm right on top of these deer by any, and where I'm going to hunt. Like I'm a ways off of it. But I was just like, I realized, man, I'm, when I'm parking my car here, I'm blowing deer out. I was like, he has to know that. And so what I was, what I did was I basically accessed the property from the complete opposite side, sat one time and killed that deer. Mm -hmm. And it was because I threw him that curveball. He mm -hmm. was patterning me. What, and, and I almost, when it clicked in my head, I was like, I can use that against him now. And so with me not being there, he was like, coast is clear. This guy's not here. Let's go. And so he came in and I killed that deer over bait. That was the first buck I ever killed over bait, but it was like, I almost had to sit there and relearn how to hunt over bait. There's so many different sort of like do's and don'ts of it all. Yeah. You know, one, even one of them is like, I was hunting with a buddy of mine in Birmingham and this is a couple of years after we've, you know, kind of learned how to hunt around bait and he's like flinging his corn pile out and he's just flinging it. And like kernels of corn are hitting the tree that he's going to be climbing up in. And in my head, I'm like, dude, that's, that's a, that's a no, no, like feed as far away from your stand as possible. You want to have those deer like away from you, mm -hmm. like get, there is a buffer there, like in, in a bubble, like keep those deer out of your bubble. And I was like, try to feed, you know, I, t I told him, I was like, dude, try to feed like 40 yards away. Like you'll, you'll give way less pressure on those deer mm -hmm. that are coming in. If you're even that 20 yard further back off, is going to make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I don't mean to get too caught up on that. No, it's okay. We find ourselves in that rut all the time, but well, dude, so, you know, <laughs> we, uh, we're obviously familiar with like the channel and we've kind of like loosely watched you guys grow and like, it's, it's awesome to see what you're doing. Um, was cool to get some, uh, perspective on that started on some surrounding farms in the area, but then you guys brought it kind of back in you and Drew started doing seek one. Was it seek one from the get go? And that was like YouTube videos in the Atlanta area is kind of how it all started. I'm trying to remember. I mean, we started with, <clears throat> so yeah, so we started, uh, you know, hunting deer in Atlanta and started killing some big deer and, uh, that were just notable and people were kind of paying attention to it. And, mm -hmm. um, there was one deer in particular that was just like <clears throat> ridiculous and drew 
the previous year had hunted a 200 inch deer and hunted it like just the whole season like religiously and uh the deer ended up getting killed like last bit of the season by someone else and so he was like almost burnt out in a sense like mm -hmm. so the following season i was had this story evolving with this deer we called charlie and so drew was like i'm hanging up the bow i'm, I'm pretty much just gonna film you like he just wanted to you know kind of uh i guess he was interested in the filming side and we were kind of like man these stories we have are kind of crazy it'd be cool to just like film at one time and so we ended up filming that deer and we did a trailer for it and then uh a buddy of ours who was tight with mossy oak i guess pitched the idea of us doing like a facebook series for mossy oak and i i think we just called it suburban bow hunter it wasn't even wasn't even called seek one mm -hmm. and uh so it's like a suburban bow hunter series that was on Mossy Oaks Facebook. And then when we, you know, kind of started our own, like, Hey, this is like a, I guess we need a name. It was kind of in the middle of that process that we came up with the name C1 hmm. and it was a, a double meaning of like our faith being important to us. And then the telling the story of seeking one deer. Mm -hmm. So seeking one deer, seeking one God. And that was like a, a double meaning to it all. It's a great um, name. When, when was then, that uh, Lee? Like a year approximately? uh let me see so i've got some plaques on the wall hold on because you remember it was like uh, i don't know it was one of the ata shows i think we were with duncan over at the muddy booth and mm -hmm. i think that was the first time like it, whether it was lee or drew was carrying a buck around and like hey you need to talk to these guys mm -hmm. like they're killing these bucks in like suburban south and i was like what vaguely <laughs> vaguely i think that was like 2015 yeah that sounds yep. right uh it was, seven, about, seven it was about that time. Yep. That would sound right, because that's about the time we started working with those guys. Who was the, are you comfortable saying, who was the guy at Mossy Oak that got you guys plugged in there? Um, Matt Hahn. I don't know Matt, do you? Mm -mm. He was, uh, he was, uh, he's like a land guy. I, I don't even really know how he knew all those guys, but he's, he's just been in the industry for a while and yeah. we were buddies with him. Probably just saw some of your stuff on YouTube but and was I, like, dude, we gotta, we gotta be on this. Yeah. Well, it's kind of funny and this is like a, a cool story so y'all mentioned ata we went to ata the year we were carrying those those i remember you know, it. the deer heads in there <laughs> yeah and uh we went into it and i guess we've been doing it for a couple years maybe we've been filming for a couple years maybe three years or something like that um you know no had gotten almost no traction at all it wasn't like we started doing it and immediately took off it was it was probably three or four years Wow. Uh, just kind of just living in the trenches. And we got to a point where, you know, we had an account and I, th I think we had like, I think we had like $150 left in the account. Maybe it was like $200 left in the account. Oh, a bank we, account. We went to ATA. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You guys were serious. We were like, <laughs> ATA, Taco Bell. Hey, I'm should, not really sure we what should, we're hey, going to do. We should get one of those, a bank account. <laughs> you ever think of it? <laughs> So we went to ATA and I think after like, you know, dr we drove up there or whatever. I think we had like 200 bucks left in the account. We were like, Hey, we, we've got to line up some paying sponsors. Like the, the jump from product yeah. to actually like collecting dollars is a, is a huge jump. Mm -hmm. I mean, the wall there is that barrier is, is mm -hmm. really tough to break. Yep. And so I remember going into it, <clears throat> I was like, Drew, if, if we don't line up some sponsor dollars, uh, we're just done. Like, we're just going to have to, to, to be done with this thing because we can't see, can't, we can't keep sinking our time and money into this. Yeah. And, and just, you know, like this has to stop at some, like at some point we've got to say yes mm -hmm. or no. And, it, and it's going to be no, if we can't line up any dollars, cause we just can't be giving money into this thing yeah. anymore. So Drew at that time, he was working for a home builder. I was selling life insurance um, in Atlanta and I've had a bunch of weird jobs over the years, but <laughs> we go to this ATA meeting and we were like, all right, we've got to line up some dollars or this is done. At the end of uh, ATA it was like, no, it was nobody, nobody, <laughs> nobody was interested. <laughs> so we, we literally drew and I were like, all right, well, um, we got $200. Let's, uh, let's go have a really nice ass dinner. 
And so that's what we did. Like we went and blew the $200 on like a steakhouse or something. I don't remember what it was. <clears throat> Had a few adult be- beverages and just mm-hmm. like basically called it done. Yeah. <laughs> hey, know, hey, like, we made it, we had a good like run. We were, <laughs> wow. It, it, yeah. I mean, it was, it was like, this has been a good run, you know? Uh, it was fun and, and let's just keep on moving on. So we were at that point, we were literally done. And, uh, we came back and ATA is what it's in, uh, January. January. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So we came back and it's like, uh, you know, January, February. And I, I looked at our YouTube page, which Drew had made a, you know, the seek one page and we were making, had been making videos for Mossy Oak, but he just put the videos on YouTube almost as just like a, just storing them there. Sure. And, and uh, you know, we've been trying to grow our Instagram the whole time. And I think we had like a few thousand followers on Instagram and we had like really spent the last several years trying to grow our Instagram. Well, our, our YouTube channel had like 10,000 subscribers <laughs> from just putting the hunting videos up. And it was like, no, no thumbnails, no titles, <laughs> no corn like, piles. <laughs> Talk about your oh, beginner's yeah, luck. You're like, hey, it's just the one spot we never thought about. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, you know, that was when like fishing uh, blew up with on YouTube. With, yeah. Like, the Guggen Squad, Guggen Squad guys. guys. Yeah. 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 And I was like, man, uh, before we like really call this thing done, let's just upload a couple fishing videos and like we'll see. Like we needed it to, YouTube could be the place. Fishing like videos. We built 10,000 subscribers. Say what? Fishing videos. Fishing videos, yeah. Because it was at that point, it's February, March. Yeah, so there's nothing and, you're uh, going to shed hunt maybe, but that's it. So what were you selling like at ATA? Right. You're like, hey, we, you know, we hunt and fish <laughs> and we put stuff on Instagram or what What was for sale? It's a dream. Man. <laughs> sell the dream. <laughs> so we're selling the dream. Hey. <laughs> Yeah, we're like, this is going to be big, man. You know, we're the only guys doing the suburban hunting. Like, yeah. it's, you know, it's going to be popular. Everyone can do it. It's just just selling the dream. So, and the, selling and the, the dream vision. and maybe life insurance in case and you're life interested. Insurance in, case you, in case you're needing that as well. Or a home. We can build you a home also. Where, where did the videos yeah. live then, other than YouTube? Like, what was the main place where you'd be like, hey, go watch our stuff here? I, it, our only, like bit of credibility we had was like, you know, we've done the Mossy Oak series. Mossy Oak series. We did a, a series for Mossy Oak. That was our biggest sales pitch was like, yeah. the, our only bit of, uh, you know, credibility was that series that we put together for their Facebook page. Yep. Um, we had nothing of our own though. Like we had, we didn't have our own platform. Sure. Right. You know, it was you know, I remember sitting there saying, but, you know, Mossy Oaks Facebook page has this amount of uh, followers on it. And, you know, we're po- we're doing this series and we were selling them on not even our own sure. platform yeah. in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. For our own following. We're selling them on someone else's following. Right. I do vaguely uh, remember this. I mean, mm-hmm. dude, I would have been. Yeah. I would have been 22. Uh, 21, 22. You, 22 you first started working for 23. Me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's cool. And, and at that time, like, it was, uh, suburban hunting was, um, uh, people have, t- I've, I've just had random conversations <clears throat> and uh, people have told me like, oh, suburban hunting is not really that controversial anymore. Like, it's so, it's so widely done now mm. that it's just not, it's not as controversial <laughs> as it used to be. But those early years when we were kind of the first ones, people were looking at us like, what is this? Yeah. yeah. Like that. Yeah. And so it was extremely controversial. Uh, I feel like anyways, when we really first started doing it, because it was just opening uh, the eyes to a lot of people of the potential opportunities that were out there. And then I think what just happened was it became so popular that people were really enjoying it and there was more people doing it Mm -hmm. and uh part of my you know pitch was like especially to a bow company was like hey to suburban hunt you have to shoot a bow right and i was like we are you we're right in that demographic we're Mm -hmm. like you know we're getting we're we're appealing to people that are getting into hunting 
Mm -hmm. that maybe have not been into hunting. Like we're getting new crowds into hunting. And that was kind of what part of the, you know, set, pitching, pitching the dream to some of these companies. But, uh, well, dude, and the, the tough was, part uh, about that in the industry at that time is things like YouTube and, and well, mainly YouTube, but even Facebook and stuff like the credibility to producing a show on a, at that time, what people considered or industry people considered a free platform like YouTube didn't have value. They're just like, well, anybody can post on YouTube. Like anybody can make YouTube videos, which is so weird because that was when we, we were in a weird teetering standpoint of the value of TV versus the value of digital. Mm -hmm. And you had guys like Midwest Whitetail or Growing Deer who had a digital platform that were monetizing it. But most of us who were doing YouTube videos, dude, manufacturers didn't want to pay people to put their stuff on a free platform. Mm -hmm. They didn't recognize the value of what YouTube is today. I bet they did think that the suburban aspect was really cool. I mean, I remember the first time I heard that, I was like, wow, that's, that's really cool. That's It's like a sweet little niche, but you're probably right. It was probably overshadowed by the fact that you guys weren't on the you Outdoor Channel or the yeah. Sportsman's Channel. And at that exactly. time, that was the deal breaker. They're like, well... You know, yeah, you're not paying for product. air time, so like I can't, I can't really justify paying you money. Mm -hmm. One hundred percent, y'all are right. I mean, YouTube for the longest time was like look, just looked down upon, yeah, and that it was just a joke. It's crazy, and now it's like <laughs> look now, it's like we're, we're the only ones left, shit. the people on YouTube. Everybody else is gone. <laughs> That's so weird. There's a, there has been such a hard shift from, you know, like. Back in the day when we, when there was a, there was a wave on YouTube of hunting content, mm -hmm. like it was us, THP and maybe Chris, like there was, there, yeah, there really wasn't that many like content creators that no. were consistently posting hunting content on YouTube. And there was a boom. And wow. <clears> they, they like were, we they were blocked out of it, dude. Not, not to cut you off, but the outdoor channel wouldn't allow you to post, uh, original content. Like they owned it. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, yeah, you can't put it on yeah. YouTube. Maybe like a year or two after we That's what it. choked out a lot of what we knew as content producers versus yeah. and they couldn't walk away from that money. Wave. Yeah. They couldn't walk away from that money. So like, yeah, the outdoor channel really, I mean, it set them back, you know, set years. some people back years. Yeah. Yeah. It's there. Yeah. So, I mean, and th there was that boom where like people rode that wave, mm -hmm. that boom is gone. Oh yeah. <laughs> we, it's, it's not like we had some big like, vision or some for you know some intellectual thinking that was like oh we need to be on this platform because it's the next big thing it was just like the only thing that was really available to us yeah and so you know now that time has gone on and the floodgates have opened and everyone is going to youtube like we had pos have positioned ourselves well there that we've already kind of built that platform i i building a hunting channel on YouTube today is probably a hundred times harder than it was when we were doing it back in the day yeah. because mm -hmm. it was only THP us and maybe yeah. Chris B that saturated were like, for yeah. sure. hunting content. Yeah. yeah. And so like all eyes were on the, on us essentially. It's like, yeah, we would post some stupid video and it'd get 800,000 views on YouTube, like yeah. automatic. Mm. Um, and now it's like, it's sort of leveled out today where it's like, you know, our average is, I don't know, anywhere between 150 to 300, mm. uh, which is kind of the more the consistency there. But um, yeah. And it's, it's just because like, it's, it's the same thing that happened on the fishing side. You yeah. know, it's like these original Google guys, they blew up and then all of a sudden everyone has fishing channels. Yep. So it's like the viewership it was just kind of spread out. So it's, it, yeah, same thing on the hunting side. There's just there's a lot of content creators out there, which is great, and it's grown the hunting yeah. space, which is awesome. Uh, but that's just kind of like the dynamic of YouTube is it is the hot place, and everyone transitioned there. So, Leah, and you don't have to get into it if you if you don't want, but I know it wasn't too long ago that um, I guess it was you, uh, Flair, like you guys had some issues with YouTube from Rick? the demonetization side. Not Rick. Woo! Oh. Woo! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Yeah, but you guys, you guys had run into some issues. Obviously, you like you said, you built this platform, and then all of a sudden, there's some yeah. changes that come into play. That it's like, why Whoa, are you letting those guys? You say them in flair? Well, because they, they were at the time; these were the guys who were talking about demonetization of hunting videos in particular. Are you talking about the thermal brand? No, no, no. 
Flair as in his channel, uh, uh, YouTube channel. Who's that? What's Flair's real name? He's really Googling guys. Yeah, one of the original. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, not a Fisher. Flair is his channel. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, but you, so um, you've got these large channels that basically then had a sweeping monetization issue. issues. Yeah. Well, same issue with, I mean, Rogan's probably most well known. It's like mm-hmm. they start flagging us, you know, that's why he's not on YouTube anymore. Sure. Yeah. I mean, censorship these days is like out of control. I mean, we even had uh, issues on Instagram recently where they hit a bunch of hunting channels or hunting pages. And it was like basically saying that we're going to show your content only to mm-hmm. your followers and not promote it to anybody else. Yeah. yeah. And we had to like go through the appealing process and it's back to normal now, but kind of the same thing happened with YouTube where I think they made some kind of internal, you know, rules or regulation change something, something that triggered a bunch of hunting channels. Well, they included, so, what they did was they included hunting as uh, it was like a part of their sensitive content list. And so everything that was getting promoted that was tagged or described hunting in some way was getting flagged automatically. We remember that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, the, the ad revenue from YouTube was like, I mean, that was uh, our safety net, like not our safety net, but like that's what paid our bills. Yeah. It was you know, that's what paid our gas. Yeah. Yeah. It was the lifeblood to it all. It's like, when you cut that out, you just cut our legs out from underneath us and there was no warning. It was just, everything's great. We had, we've had no videos flagged in our history ever. All of a sudden, boom, one day, the whole thing's gone. And, um, we kind of caused enough of an uproar, uh, where YouTube basically said it was like not intentional. Um, and then they eventually did give every, get every, give everyone's monetization back. Uh, and they said that like the outdoor sector is a huge portion of YouTube and they make a lot of money, obviously from us being there. And they're like, we want you, we want hunters here. We want fishermen here. And they were like, this was kind of an error, but what they've done since is like, if you don't play by their rules, they'll just flag the video and you'll get no ad revenue from that video. So like, there's a lot of boxes you have to check. And so like, if we, if we actually kill a deer, uh, we have to check a certain like mob violence box Hmm. and it still keeps us eligible for ads. But if we don't click that box, the whole video will be demonetized. Wow. So if we do a hunting video where we don't kill something, we don't have to click that box. We can just leave it, you know, normal and we don't have any issues. But like, if you're not checking that one little box, it's a, it's a big time issue. They're just wanting you to play by the rules and it's a very finicky thing. And I feel like it's reached a more stable place, Mm. but again, it's like, you have to be checking these boxes or else, you know, they'll just take the whole thing. We've walked a, or found a safe place here where YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, they don't think we can actually kill deer. They just think we talk about it. We just talk about it. So yeah, Yeah. all we do is post clips of us talking about it and we've never had any I mean, TikTok TikTok is by far probably the most sensitive from a, from a censorship. You post anything, even a video of a deer and it's, it's flat. Yeah, they're done. It's done. I quit posting on TikTok because I kept, I kept just, you know, everything was just getting flagged. Yep, and I was just like, everything. I don't, don't want to do this. It's crazy. But, yeah. Well, it's a, you know, it, to your point, there's a, there's obviously a lot of players now on the YouTube space from a hunting side and a fishing side. And, you know, uh, the key is consistent content and, you know, you guys, THP, I mean, you're, you're probably the most consistent in the content that's coming out and, and still then building those followers and, and having, you know, consistent views on those videos and participation because Jared and I talk about all the time, you know, even though there's a lot of people on YouTube, the consistency of content for most of these producers is not, doesn't exist, Mm -hmm. right? It's one video, five months later, there's another one. Then maybe next year they well, do four. One of the biggest changes that you've seen with the transition to digital is at one time you made what is it, whatever it is, uh, 13, 22 minute episodes, yep. and they dropped the year after. I think you know Bill Wink. Bill Winky was kind of <clears throat> one of the first guys that was doing the the real time stuff. He's like, hey, every Monday I'm going to drop what happened this past week yep. in an online platform. Evolved to now, it's like, hey man, like we we drop stuff. You know, for us, it's it's every week, the week that we record it. For you guys, you know, everybody's got a slightly different schedule, but it's got to it's got to be recent and it's got to keep coming. And like we've people have had to really adapt. You know, I've heard people say like, man, you're working 
twice as hard for half the money. And that, you know, maybe that is true. That's not why we're doing it. But for guys that experience the heyday of like sponsorships and t- the TV world, it's, it's quite a different space that we're in now. Mm-hmm. It's for sure a different space. I mean, just kind of insider look like contracts and stuff that we've heard from those TV days Unreal. are ridiculous. I know. Yeah, I know. Ridiculous. And it's like, that is that is a thing of the past. Those numbers <laughs> and like yes. the, that amount of sponsor dollars, they don't exist I, anymore. Well, listen, dude, I've heard people, stuff I, recently. I've heard stuff recently of people that you used to know, do you know, writing, uh, uh, est- whatever it is, uh, quotes, estimates. They're like, hey, yeah, here, proposals. Hey, proposal. Here's here's what I want for. And I, people will tell me this. I'm like, I didn't even know that person still had a show. Like, was still around. And I'm like, I would never ask for that amount. Of I money. still deal with it on a daily basis. I know you. I, do. I get multiple contract requests for a hundred thousand dollars, and I'm like, I know. No heads just explode. No, <laughs> like for what? Yeah, yeah. it's crazy. Well, I think there was, I think there were seven figure contracts. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, back in the tv and stuff and oh, yeah. it's like that would never ever ever happen in today's Mm-mm. world of, mm. of hunting like I, I think people do get a misconception of like you know oh you put, brought on a new sponsorship they must be paying <laughs> an astronomical amount of money it's like man it's it's kind of tough out here on the streets you know with with getting sponsored dollars. and it's because again like there may have been two or three top tv shows sure you know back in the day where they we're kind of taking the bulk of it but now you have so many different avenues of content, you know, podcast, YouTube, like all these different platforms, Instagram, just that there's, there's so many different ways that it's, it's spread out. So it's not like it's all going to certain, you know, like top areas, like it, like it kind of used to. Um, I'm sure these manufacturers are saving a boatload of money. Like, I mean, they, they can basically cover more ground for probably a lot less money. And, and likely see the effectiveness in a much more detailed form. I don't know. I mean, I think about, like, the guys you used to see on, like, the Outdoor Channel Sports mm-hmm. Channel. Like, you would it would get shoved down your throat, like, Winchester's Whitetail Wednesdays, mm-hmm. and, you know, whatever it was. Like, you would see that stuff over and over. There's there's companies that I know are big companies and stuff that I haven't heard from in years. You know what I mean? It's like... So somebody's buying their stuff, I guess, but yeah. I'm, not, I'm not seeing it. I, I mean, I think a lot of them feel like they don't have to market like that anymore. You know, they could they could pay Maybe. an influencer, these five influencers, half of what they did for that one title sponsor, and it's probably way more effective at this point with the way that marketing and content is consumed. Yeah. That's what I would look at it. Hmm. The, sp- the sponsor world is is uh, is tough. Yeah. Um, we've been, we've been, well, you know, <laughs> now that we've positioned ourselves like kind of where we are with YouTube and stuff and, and with it being like the place, you know, we get offers all the time, like all the time and, and big <laughs> offers. Like, I mean, not compared to what the stuff used to be, but sure. like very good offers from just different, this company, Hey, use this blah, blah. blah. And it's like, we turn down that stuff all the time. Mm-hmm. And because we are, we are very probably overly cognizant of, uh, you know, that, that like trustworthiness and it is in, and credibility is like huge for us. Yeah. Um, so like we have turned down tons of sponsorship dollars for the sake of like be, keeping our integrity w- of the show, like at the highest place we possibly can. Yeah. Um, we've walked away from other products that were paying more to work with a product company that's paying significantly less because we like this other product better. Yeah. And um, YouTube lets you do that, right? Yeah. I mean, that extra revenue coming through YouTube is giving you, whereas like For in the sure. TV days, it was all sponsorship dollars. There was no other revenue yeah. stream to help offset that. Well, frankly, that's the way it should be. I mean, that's what kind of screwed the the hunting content industry up to begin with was that it was solely driven by manufacturer influence. Hey, I'll pay you a million dollars to shoot this bow or or whatever it is, this gun. And um, so, of course, you're going to take that. Yeah, I'll shoot whatever you want me to shoot. You know, I mean, that Mm -hmm. that was the mentality of like those big TV show personalities because that's who was in the driver's seat. It wasn't them. They were... You know, they were the vehicle. It was the the manufacturers were making the decisions. They were the master. Puppeteer. They had the money. So yeah. I do love like where we're at now, seeing uh, content producers getting paid directly by or because of their viewers. Hey, people like this show, so the platform rewards them. They're not 
outright buying it. Like, hey, Netflix, I'm going to buy Seek One and put it on here. But YouTube is acknowledging you guys get views and we're going to pay you a portion of, you know, the non-endemic ad revenue. Mm -hmm. The the ad revenue and the merch sales help significantly, like like more than people know, Yeah, help more with creative freedom than anything because it does have us not rely on, uh, you know, taking deals that we don't want to take, but have to take to keep the lights on. Yep. Uh, the merch and the ad revenue, I mean, that, that's the biggest thing for us and like is, is our biggest supporter. And, and I say all this with like the sponsorship stuff, like we put a lot of time and attention into the partners we do work with. Um, you know, like we have very, very tight relationships with our partners now that we have been burned in the past. Mm. And I wish that I could kind of freely unpack a lot of that stuff but <laughs> for the sake of like us taking the high road with certain yeah. things. Like we just have decided to not. Yeah. Um, but I've met some amazing people in this industry, like some of the best people that, that you can ever possibly meet. And, uh, but just like with any industry there, there's people out there with the wrong motives and wrong ambitions and intentions. And it's like, we, you know, kind of backtracking our story. Like we didn't grow up in the hunting industry. We had to kind of figure this out on our own. You know, we were kind of thrown into this pretty quickly and it's like, you know, we don't, know all these people we're kind of just having conversations and figuring out ourselves and there's there's been a couple times where um you know we worked on on certain projects that just like ended up burning us in the long run and 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 they're lessons learned like you're not gonna have a business and go through it flawlessly you're you're gonna have those hiccups and stuff and you just do the best you can but yeah well, it, it really is people based too i mean if you have a bad experience with somebody at a company it's more than likely just it's not I mean, I'm sure it does happen, but it's not a bad company necessarily. It's just, you know, so-and-so was a, a jerk, right, yeah. or, or whatever. So it's, yeah, there's no there's no point in dragging somebody through the mud. or, or Yeah, it, it happens. It's situational. No. We're, we're the same way, too. Well, and, dude, to respond to your, like, you know, you guys were thrown in it, there is no, I mean, yeah, there are, you know, literally children whose parent, like Eva Shockey, grew up in the hunting industry, right? Yeah. Or, or uh, Mason Waddell. Like, there are yeah. people who it's like, you know, that's maybe all they know, but... For a lot of us, it's like, and nobody, nobody, grew, you know, it has that intimate of a knowledge. I mean, Jeremy's been working in the outdoor industry as long as anybody, and every day we're meeting new people. Oh, yeah. and we're like, hey, dude, Lee from Seek, you know, from Seek One, it's like this is a new thing for us, like a new relationship. And frankly, this podcast has been so valuable. Like, it's it's allowed us to expand our network and meet people across the industry that we never would have talked to otherwise, mm-hmm. just purely out of wouldn't have given us the time of day, right? Or it's just. Uh, you know, and so it's fun. It's fun to be able to leverage this platform to be able to have conversations with people we find interesting and we want to talk to, and we'll use that. I'll say, Hey dude, we got a platform. We'll put you on there. I, I, I want to talk to you. You know, I'm, I'm curious to hear people's stories yeah. and, um, yeah, it's, it's been fun to me. That, to me, that is the, the beauty of social media is, you know, I've met, like I said, some of the just most amazing people you could possibly ever meet. Some of the just best people out there and it's been through social media. It's mm-hmm. unfortunate that there is such a dark world of social media, but there are a lot of really awesome things. Yeah. Just being able to connect with people and get to, you know, meet new friends and, and, and make new buddies and stuff uh, that have all come from social media. One of my, one of my friends who I'm, I'm extremely close with uh, posted a TikTok video like five years ago. One of my buddies saw it and sent him a DM and was like, hey, that's a big deer. And they connected that way. As time goes on, I connected with, you know, this guy that posted the TikTok. His name is Jason. Okay. And it's like, we've become extremely good buddies because the dude posted a TikTok. Yeah. You know, it's like, we're able to connect that way. It's like, we've got this amazing friendship. And so it's, you know, that part to me is like the really cool side of it. It is really cool. Dude, that, uh, the big buck I was talking about earlier, uh, CJ Alexander is the kid that shot him. He's whatever, wherever he ends up falling, you know, after the scoring panel and stuff like that, it's, it's a giant deer. It's like one of the top Ohio deer. And, uh, we were in Kansas, uh, Jeremy and I, and our dads, like just gawking over this deer, looking at picture, you know, we saw a picture on Facebook. We're like, holy cow, it's a freaking giant. And then like half an hour later, Jeremy and I are driving to the uh, gas station and we're going to pick up beer and stuff. And the kid writes me on Facebook, like personal <laughs> message. He's like, Hey dude, a uh, big fan of the podcast. Just wanted to show you this giant deer I shot. I'm like, dude, you're not gonna believe it. Just yeah, we it. know we've been, we've been looking at it for two days. And then I, you know, I give my phone over, we, we end up talking and then he drives out here, you know, a week later or whatever. And, and it's, so it's, it is cool, you know, to see 
you know, you always hear about like, oh, social media can make great connect connections and stuff, but most of what we see, you know, eighty percent of it is the dark stuff. You see the comments of just sure. like, oh, trolls, trolls, and this and that. But it is cool to see a real life example of of you know friendships or, or connections being built. So that way. Lee, I mean, as you and Drew are, you know, kind of, you know, whatever, into your seventh, eighth, ninth year here on on the Seek One side. I mean, what are you guys seeing? from like an actual hunting standpoint in these different er suburban areas that you're going to? Is it like, man, cats out of the bag now? Like <laughs> things, well, things I, are thick. Can I yeah, expand on your it. question yeah, too? It. Is like, we've seen recently, you guys are branching out. You're hunting, you know, lots of Kansas, states now. Kansas, Ohio. Yeah, yeah. So what's the, you know, in tandem to Jeremy's question, what's happening there in the Atlanta area, but what's the future for the, you know, you guys hunting out of state and stuff like that looking like? Yeah. I mean, suburban hunting, I kind of made the joke earlier that we, you know, the cat's out of the bag. You like, pulled the Chris B of Kansas, basically. <laughs> yeah, everybody knows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, uh, you know, th this is kind of a touchy topic, and, like, my stance on it is, like, yeah, we've, we've increased the pressure. Like, there's there's uh, more people hunting these bucks, and that's kind of come back to bite us from the sense of, like, we're chasing a deer, there's more pressure, there's other guys on it. But, like, to me, the bigger mission at hand and, like, what has always been more important to me was like, I was a kid from the city yeah, and I should not have been, in, I should not be in love with hunting. Like I just shouldn't be. And what I, what is more important to me as opposed to having one or two extra guys hunting a buck that I'm hunting is that there are other guys out there hunting now because they went and knocked on a door or they knew Miss Betty or their aunt had five acres. And it's like, to me, that's more important is having more people finding this passion because like dude the hunting I, I i cannot imagine my life without it yeah like i truly mean that i would be lost yeah. like i just don't know what we i say it all the time dude it. i said if you're not bow hunting what are you doing yeah <laughs> right and so like i want to pass that on to the next kid that's 15 years old 16 years old doesn't have a farm that he grew up in and maybe like dude i didn't choose to be born in atlanta you know just like a bunch of my buddies that hunt different ways like they were born in a rural area they hunt the way they hunt i could have easily been born in their shoes and could have been hunting big woods and that's what right. i would have been doing i didn't choose to be born in atlanta i just happened to be born here and so like i want to give that other other opportunity to open the eyes to those other kids out there that like you know, use your resources, use your networking, like you can find a way to hunt and make it your own. And it's like, if it means a fraction of what it's meant to me, that what it means to them, like to me, that's, that's the bigger sort of mission at hand. And, and yeah, like we have increased the pressure significantly in suburban areas because it's a popular thing now. But uh, to me, there's just like a more important uh, you know, sort of role in, in, in hand, I guess. But uh, we've had to evolve. Drew is uh, the last two years has struggled on the whitetail side. And he's <clears throat> every day calling me like, I went door knocking today. And every single house I went door knocked, you know, they already got someone or they've been asked huh. 10 times. And wow. so he's been, you know, kind of struggling to, to find some deer to get on. Uh, he's finally found a couple bucks to hunt, but we just had to have had to adapt to like, okay, this area has got pressure. Let's go find some other, you know, sneak slide into some other right. areas that may have less pressure that aren't as obvious on a map. And so it's kind of, you're having to constantly evolve your strategies as a hunter to find, you know, the next story to have next buck to chase and things like that. Um, but I've, I've had so many people that have gotten involved in the suburban side because of our videos or just from, you know, however they landed up, ended up getting into suburban hunting. It's like, once I'm able to connect and talk with those people and they're having the same stories that we're having, they're like, Oh, I've been chasing this buck. I call him this. And like, this is my second year. And I just, he's dodging me and I can't figure it out. And it's like, that's what makes it all fun is kind of building that that community and we can look at it through a selfish way if we want to which is uh you know keeping it more to ourselves but mm -hmm. like to us there was kind of a bigger, bigger you know mission at play but um i guess transitioning into your question of like going into <clears throat> into other states um not that i feel like i've conquered atlanta by any means like there's 
there's always, I've got several deer here that are kicking my tail right now. Um, I think what I was just looking at was like, I, first off, I wanted to prove that this wasn't just an Atlanta thing that you mm -hmm. can, this, this is rep, rep, replicable. Yeah, that's right. Rep, rep, repeatable. Repeatable. Right. Yeah. Yep. Either one. Or replicable. I think that's a word. I'll say Repli that's a word. Replicable. Yeah. It's repeatable yeah. or, and or replicable <laughs> across several different states, like basically anywhere. Yeah. Um, and so that was part of it was, well, I want to go to Kentucky. I want to go to Ohio. I want to go to, you know, Tennessee and Alabama and uh, Michigan and all these other states, Oklahoma, and um, prove that you can do this in other places. That was part of it. I would probably say the bigger part of it, though, was like, I'm always looking for the next challenge. Mm -hmm. Like that's what kind of always drives me or drives my obsession is like the next challenge. And to me, the next challenge was do it in a different state, do it in a different, different city and, you know, expanding outside of that. That's why I've gone to Kansas was, and was like, I want to prove myself in the most extreme, vast, open country, rural places the total opposite of what we do on the suburban side, like that's the next challenge for me. That's what's kind of driven me to go out to Kansas and Kansas is my favorite thing on planet earth to go do is to hunt out there. Um, and I've, I've had good luck there the last couple of years. And it's like, <clears throat> I'm, I'm looking at, I've kind of, this is a weird year for me. Cause I've like kind of, uh, pushed the suburban game, like to the extreme, like as far as it can be pushed. And I've almost had to like take a step back and kind of reevaluate where I'm at. Um, and so I'm like really digging deep to figure out like, okay, what, what would I enjoy doing next? Like what's the next challenge that's going to keep like my passion burning for hunting? Is it in the suburbs in a different place? Is it, is it going rural? Is it public? Is it, you know, what is that next thing that's going to like keep, the hunting, you know, the passion I have for hunting, like burning as bright as it was the first day that I started doing it. And that, that's kind of where I'm at, mm -hmm. uh, right now. But I mean, I think the, the hard um, part, like you said, obviously more people hunting in these suburban areas. The other thing is like, you know, those, those wood lots are disappearing more and more housing plans, shopping centers, whatever. Like it's just, you're, you're constantly losing more ground. And so you're forcing more hunters into tighter areas essentially. So, you know, it, it very well could be stabilizing over the last few years, but loss of habitat is creating more pounded, you know, areas because the hunters don't have anywhere else to go. They have to be in these areas. That's all that's left. There's always going to be big deer that make it. Yeah. I don't care how many hunters, are in these areas, there are always going to be big deer that make it every single year. They're just, they are masters at avoiding hunters and finding, really finding nooks and crannies to exist and live in where they are getting away from the pressure. Like they are, and that that's anywhere. That's, you know, go somewhere rural. Yeah. You know, it's well, here's, here's a big difference like though. I would assume Lee is you guys don't have like the all hands on deck gun seasons in the city limits, right? That's a big part of it. Yeah. That's a big part of it. I mean, yeah, we talk about the place I was hunting in Ohio, the, the place I was hunting in Ohio uh, is potentially gun season year round. Um, more from a, uh, this, uh, like street side of it everyone like what i'm saying is where i hunted in ohio was the sketchiest place i've ever hunted in my life and i'm sure that those deer get shot at with handguns you well, think so they probably do 100 <laughs> yeah. percent. sideways I've, yeah. I've talked <laughs> to people that it, yeah so it's, it's sideways 100 percent. but i've i mean i've Kill had shot. interactions with people where they told me that wow yeah Hmm. That's why I do think that's probably, but no, I, was, I mean, I'm mainly, joking. no, I do but think that's, I'm mainly joking, but yes, yeah, but seriously. Yeah. <laughs> Kelsey, your point, like, <laughs> gun seasons. I think, I yeah. think it's the guns. Yeah. I'm I mean, mainly joking, but, like, but seriously, <laughs> I, <all right. laughs> no, it's all right. We're, no, I mean the, you go, sorry. I'm, I'm mainly joking, but the, yeah, the gun, the gun season's not being, 
a thing in these suburban areas is sure. a huge, yeah. huge equation to but it. But that's why they need bow hunting to control the population. I mean, sure. most of these areas, and I'm sure you've run across several of them, Lee, where, you know, whatever, the borough or the township decides that sharpshooting is necessary because the hunters can't contain the deer numbers to the uh, appropriate population. And I'd rather obviously have too many suburban bow hunters than have sharpshooters come in and be wiping out these deer. I don't, I don't like the sharpshooter solution at all. No. Um, a lot of, a lot of these areas are, uh, legitimately extremely overpopulated. And that's another benefit to having a lot of hunters. Now, as long as they're taking, they need to take does. And right. That's why we do our doe every year to try and encourage that. Yep. Uh, but there is legitimately an overpopulation and a need for people to, for bow hunters. Yep. I don't like the solution of the sharpshooter route because it always, it always gets a little bit of like becomes a murky area with the sharpshooter thing. Uh, and I'm not going to like name certain examples, but like in some Northern States, I think that they were not supposed to shoot bucks. They were just supposed to shoot does, but we know several on several different occasions where like these sharpshooters are just trying to hunt the biggest buck that's out there and hmm. they're shooting them at night with rifles. And hmm. every year up there for the last several years, we've had, you know, very large and notable deer, not necessarily deer that we've hunted, but just buddies and deer that they've been hunting that, that every year through these sharpshooter programs, uh, get shot. I, and, everything uh, I've heard about the sharpshooter programs is anything and everything. It's like, yeah, most effective meat, it's corn piles, it's uh, suppressors, thermals, thermals. It's suppressors at night, and it's every deer that walks. Yeah. And I, yeah, I've definitely had heard that too, but there have been some certain ones where it's like uh, antlerless deer only. Mm. Which makes sense, um, right? I mean, that is, you know, knock back the, the baby producers, knock back the, the herd via the antler list, which is likely greater than the amount of bucks. And I guess it depends the on the objective, like what, what you're trying to, like in an, like an airport setting. Like I know a guy that yeah, used to, that's a complete wipeout. Yeah, I gotta, mean, they're everything can't, can't be any deer. Yeah. Either. Kill them all. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. But in a, but in a borough seen, or township, they used no. to do that. I know a guy, I know the guy that uh, used to be a part of like the program at Pittsburgh international airport. He used to help coordinate, like they would bring bow hunters in to, to mm-hmm. shoot They deer. still do. No, they don't. On the outside? Mm-mm. Yeah, it's a it's a sharpshooter program. Really? Yep they they block that off and they kill they kill everything now. Wow. We've seen a couple situations where, uh, you know, people involved with those programs have like tried to n- encourage landowners to not give hunting permission, mm-hmm. so that when they shoot sharpshoot that like there is a big buck that's out there. That that's just what I'm saying. With it, it gets a little bit muddy. The mud waters get a little muddy mm-hmm. sometimes. It's like. It's dicey, man. I Every, don't want to say everybody wants to shoot a big buck, man. It's I don't care if you say you don't sure, like yeah. there's there's a commodity on their head. Mm-hmm. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Muddy and Stealth Cam Trail Cameras. Cell cams, cell cams, cell cams. What an evolution the industry has seen. And we've experienced personally over the past five, ten, you know, whatever cameras were invented, right? It's like, man, it's totally changed the way that we inventory deer, pattern deer, and ultimately the decisions that we make when we're going out to hunt. They're a serious piece of the puzzle. And, and uh, you know, that information is invaluable for us. We trust the Muddy and Stealth Cams, you know, together to be able to, to collect any of that information. Yeah, I mean, as an admitted trail cam addict, you know, I've definitely been guilty of of under hunting places or relying too heavily on that information that's come in that said it's an invaluable tool to the overall management plan and strategy that i have for my own properties or even hunting public land it doesn't matter we have a finite amount of time in going out and hunting so when you and i are after a particular class or quality of deer usually mature buck we can't waste time hunting an area where that deer doesn't exist. And those cell cams provide that information that allow us to spend the time in the area with the highest chance to accomplish our goals. I say it all the time, man. They can't kill them if they're not there. That's it. So right now, any of our listeners can use uh, code HUNTER20 to get 20% off either muddy or stealth cameras. Uh, we're certainly going to be taking advantage of that, and we hope you guys do too. Yep, check out Stealth Cam and Muddy. I saw a comment today on Instagram that made me laugh, and it was... Uh, some giant buck, some old lady shot in Texas. I saw that. And some guy said, he said, uh, if, if that deer walked in front of me, I wouldn't shoot it because I'm a meat hunter. <laughs> I'm like, that deer's oh, got plenty of meat. That deer's got plenty of meat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nuts, man. What are you talking about? It's like, yeah, right. 
Well, it's an interesting, like, obviously, but, uh, like, I eat a ton of venison every year, uh, every week, actually. But, y- you know, <laughs> the meat hunter argument is, uh, it's so hard to, to fathom, because I'm sure there have you definitely see, have are. Have you seen that little clip from Breaking Bad? It's like when a meat hunter shoots a giant buck, and it's, it's, uh... It's uh, Mr. White or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're like, come on, give me a high five. <laughs> yes. 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 But, I mean, if you think about <laughs> that side of it, like, dude, think about how much money is spent on a hunting to then harvest whatever, 60 to 70 pounds of meat out of a out of a buck. Well, dude, you it's know. Like, it's like prime prime rib that you're, you're paying for across the board. Sure. Well, and it's never like a, it's never a, uh. It, it's not you're not saving money by getting into deer hunting, right? It's no, yeah. I mean, I mean even from me standpoint, it's going to take you a while to catch up for the stuff it, it costs you, and you're going to end up getting hooked, and then you're going to spend all this money. But dude, I I really, it's a bummer that we don't see more promotion of uh, processing, like uh, solutions, because I love I love shooting does, like I think it's a blast. I hate what comes next. I, ju- I mean, yeah, there's an, a therapeutic element of from time to time. I like to process a deer and that's mm-hmm. fun and yeah, stuff. Yeah, but if but you got seven of them hanging. Yeah, for the most part, it's <laughs> that's work. And if I could take a doe and drop that off, like the whole the whole carcass, um, and they would take care of it and, and make sure that it got to, pe- you know, uh, people without food. Yeah, needy families. It just seems like there's such a miss there to promote programs like that. And like the network that they need to make it easy for people to drop it off. Like I, I would easily drive a half an hour and drop off a couple of does when I shoot. But it. they charge you. Like most of them charge you 60 bucks to, to donate it. Yeah. Which is, I mean. Yeah. You, it, you, we need to do everything and anything to incentivize guys to, to donate their deer. Yes. That's an issue with in, in Atlanta particularly. But I think some of the northern state, states aren't as bad, uh, but the issue in Atlanta and why we were trying to open a processor, but the city uh, that we were trying to open it in just kept throwing wrenches in it because they didn't want, you know, a deer processor in their city. The, the problem with Atlanta and why I think a lot of people don't shoot as many deer is because you got to drive an hour. I don't care kind of where you are in Atlanta. Like you got to uh, basically drive an hour to get to a processor. That's so it's insane. Like, of course, you're not going to shoot that doe standing in front of you. No, you know you're gonna you're gonna wait for the buck. And it's like we tried to find a solution mm. to opening a processor more central to Atlanta, where you know it's 20 minutes for people to go drop a deer off or less. And just with the city being the way it was, like they just kept throwing wrenches in it. And it's like we had plans to open this processor, and like we're still trying to figure out how to sort of fix that where it makes, you know, shooting deer a little more convenient. Trying to think, uh, uh, maybe, maybe you need to, area. maybe you need to rope in, uh, what's his face from drone deer. We'll come pick Yoder. it up. We'll take it out. Yeah, we'll, we'll bring you back mm-hmm. a box. And yeah, just rope it around and send it out. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, that's a big issue because, you know, it, it's not everywhere, right? I know we've, we've had a lot of discussions with people where they're like, we don't need to shoot any more does. But in a lot of these suburban areas, I mean, you got to. You, you need to mow them down from a hunting standpoint as much as possible. But, you know, there's only so much meat you're going to fit in the freezer. And to that point, like, you know, it's it's selfish. But at the same time, it's like, I don't want to drive an hour here. I don't want to pay 60 bucks to donate. It's to be yeah, I mean, it's it should be a no-brainer, very seamless. And you would have a much more successful suburban deer management program, as well as you'd have a lot of needy families being taken care of. What about even just coolers? Like, what if you could just make a network of coolers where it's like, hey, in every whatever management unit or something, I can take my deer. It's, it's open. Like, what are people going to steal it? Okay, fine. They must have yeah, needed take it. it. <laughs> you know, it. just open door, walk in, hang your deer in there, and... Every, you know, every couple of days, couple of weeks, they make the rounds and pick up all the deer. And Probably got guys like Nick leaving the door open. Yeah. Or like doing weird, <laughs> weird stuff to the deer in there, you freak. <laughs> <laughs> Touching their buttholes and stuff. <laughs> yeah. But other than that, yeah, I mean, I guess they're, yeah. you know. I mean, other than that. That's, that's the ice shanty on the, you know, situation that's there. That's not a bad idea, actually. Prostitution. It's not yeah. a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what it's going to lead to. Yeah. So, no, I mean, there's got to be a better solution around that. We have to keep us updated on the processor thing, Lee. That be. Yeah, I didn't know you guys were trying to do that. That's cool. Yeah, we're, we're, working, on it. we're working on it. It's just, it's complicated with, uh, you know, just people in the city. That's so funny. I that, wouldn't even have thought whole, about like, that. <laughs> like, if I want to open up a processor in my yard, I just yeah. do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah as- I mean, that's, that's like the whole. That's, part of the whole headache with the suburban hunting stuff is like just you're dealing with so many people 
Mm. You know, it's just like a deer crosses the wrong property line and it's just like a horrible situation. Like we, we just, it has been so nice when I have gone to like big woods or Kansas or just away from the suburbs, mm-hmm. it well, has literally not. been such a pressure. Here. And I have enjoyed that style of hunting almost more than anything because like just the elements that you're dealing with on a daily basis in the suburbs are, uh, dude, oh. it's, it's so strong. I mean, it seems it's, like, a, it seems like a major headache every time I'm yeah. out, uh, you know, in one of those areas, I'm just so, I'm so grateful that I'm like, I, away from people i'm like this is a big part of why i'm here I was like, oh, i'm just it, gonna deal with it and yeah i was gonna say i kind of saw that when you hunted with Bo and johnny up in the big woods up here yeah. like it seemed like that was like i don't know had to be refreshing for you hard you're, you're like, right no, no people no deer it's great <laughs> yeah, difficult but you know refreshing yeah. it, that was one of my like notably one of my uh most fun hunts yeah. that i've done in a long time was that pa hunt yeah. Well, they're good people. But, we like those guys a lot. No uh, boundaries, man. Like, you don't have to worry about, I can't great. go this way because there's a property line. I mean, you just go. You just hunt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how does that... Uh, yeah. What's and the, that's like... Uh, sorry, go ahead, Lee. Go ahead. No, you go. I was just going to say, like, I'll, I'll be the first to say, like, suburban hunting is not for everybody. Mm-hmm. Like, it's it's a style that some people are, like, just, it's not for them. And that, that that's fine. Like, you know, that that like, that doesn't offend me in any way, shape, or form. Uh, but just kind of like growing up where I did, it was like the only form of hunting that was available for me. Like we just kind of made the most of it. And, and I will tell you like time and time and time and time again from people that, you know, have kind of knocked suburban hunting when they go try it, they're like, oh, oh, this is kind of, this is kind of fun. This is kind of addicting. Like you get one spot, you put a camera out and it's like Christmas morning waiting to see what shows up on that camera. And then it's like, you're not pigeonholed to that place either. It's like, go get another spot. And it's like, it is the most addicting, in my opinion, one of the most addicting forms of hunting, which is go get the next spot, see what's there. Oh, but what's at this spot? Let's go get, let's try and get a spot over here and see what's over there. And it's like, you know, at any time, a giant deer could show up on any of these places that you stumble into. And like, it is, it is just such an addicting form of hunting, uh, you know, cause like a lot of, you know, for example, the farms that I started on, uh, when I was 14, like my buddy and, and his friends, they still hunt those, that, that family farm of theirs every year. He's like, yeah, we kind of know what's, what's there. Like we got three or four deer to hunt every year. He's like, and we kind of know what we're after. He's like, it's rare that something random shows up. You almost lose that element of like, it's an open door. Yeah. It, you can, you can go as far as you want to go with it. Like they're kind of s- stuck in their parameters of what's going on in that property. They're not going to go get another, you know, the neighbors and another place down the street. It's like, they're just hunting that one place. The suburban hunting thing is like, you can just keep going and going and going yeah. and going. Yeah. It's like, well, dude, it's got, it's got another layer of, and I, so I see this in you, like it's the reason I think we would probably get addicted to it if we were doing it. It's like, it requires an element of salesmanship. And when, yeah. and when you, when you sell somebody on giving you permission, it's, there's a rush in that. And j- just that interaction alone. I mean, I get it from when we go ask permission on whatever, anywhere, you're like, I did it. I, I, I got it. That was a, mm-hmm. a win in and of itself. And there's so much of that probably in the suburban stuff that you're just, you're winning. And when you get on like <laughs> a, you're, you know, I get a day full of sales calls here and you're like, I'm just, I'm, you know, like. Yeah, I'm winning, you know, yeah. and then to kill a deer on top of giant deer. Is, yeah. It's a dopamine hit for sure. When you get a, when you get a new property, when yep. you get the yes. Yep. But dude, it's, it's like, it's, you can be in the trenches. It's, it's highs and lows. Cause like, dude, yep. I've had days where I've door knock and it's just been brutal. And yep. it's like, this sucks. Yep. I've gotten 50 no's like this, this sucks. And then it's like, all of a sudden you get that one. Yes. And it's like everything changed. Yeah. You guys need to watch Wolf of Wall Street before you go out. Like every time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Pick up the phone. Oh, and go. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> That's it. That's all you need. Yeah. Those are rookie numbers. <laughs> yeah. You gotta, you gotta, we got to bump those numbers up. <laughs> yeah. oh, We're going to take this deer season into the freaking stratosphere. <laughs> That's freaking awesome. 
Well, cool, dude. Well, listen, man, wow. we uh, we appreciate you coming on and, and talking to us and navigating technical issues this morning with us for sure. Um, yeah, buddy, we'll do it again. You're welcome anytime. I, I know we had to kind of cut this one short, yeah. so and there's, there's more we want to dig into, but mm-hmm. yeah, that's good for today. Yeah. Yeah, that was on me for the technical issues. There's a, uh, we could probably talk for another 10 hours pretty easily. I feel like we didn't even scratch the surface. Oh, dude, things. we got lots. I was going to ask. I was going to ask you all what y'all's thoughts on cell cameras were. And that opens up a whole different can of worms. We should have that discussion. Can you, you got to go. Gotta I could probably push it. You want to talk it? You want to hit that point? Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. I, well, I will make time. Wait. So, <laughs> yeah. Jeremy likes talking about cell I love, cameras. Yeah. Yes. I can I had, cancel. It's funny. I had somebody. Willie texted me this morning and he's like, Hey, just interesting proposition to our group. He's like, what if you like, you know, what do you think about uh, how cell cameras says? I'm like, dude, like, uh, yeah, I know he doesn't listen to the podcast, but I'm like, it's like it's, we talk, we talk about it for hours. I was like, I just can't. Uh, we, how many, how we, many, can, we can do another one. We no, can do another no, no, no. Well, here, here's the think. here's the perspective. The, the general, I'll try to blanket it, and Jeremy can chime in. It's like we because of at a big picture, like we see, you know, hunters quitting kind of across the country, and it, maybe that's in some pockets more than others. Uh, you know, a declining hunter population, primarily because of loss of access. And I think we attribute that to things that make hunting easier, more accessible, you know, hunters more lethal. Uh, You could lump any number of things into that boat. Um, You know, more liberal gun seasons, uh, you know, corn piles, cell cameras, uh, you know, crossbows, all these things that allow, you know, for people to be more lethal and for, uh, you know, properties to be shrunk. Onyx is a huge one. You know what I mean? Talk about uh, ma- mapping softwares, things that allow us to take a big world of unknown hunting properties and make them small. Um, and cell cameras definitely are a big piece of that. The fact I can go out and run 30 of them on 30 different pro- whatever and know what's there and be able to like <laughs> selectively spend my time. It just, it really concentrates uh, the effort uh, in certain areas and it makes the hunting world uh, in the properties that are available seem so much smaller. And I, I think that's a reality. You know I mean? I do think that uh, mm-hmm. people are more efficient with their time. They're spending it in the right places where these deer are and everybody knows it. So everybody's swarming into these places. And at the same time, we love them. We, we love the information. It's so much fun to go out and pretty quickly be able to say, there's a freaking giant buck in here. And like, there, and I didn't have to go in and pressure it. Like from, from a hunting standpoint, there's, there's huge advantages and stuff. Um, so like anything in hunting and in our conversation so far, it's, it's an extreme double edged sword where we love the information. We think they're an awesome management tool. We've certainly take advantage of them, uh, and it's killed deer for us. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I love that it gets people into hunting. I get, you know, it's exciting for people, but I do think it's contributing to making the hunting, you know, the access that's available and stuff seems so much smaller. And I think that is what's causing people ultimately to quit. So it's, it's a so, cool thing, but is it ultimately killing us? I well, I mean, you just have to think about, <clears throat> you know, even if you're running manual cameras, right? The amount of time that you spend going out and check, uh, checking them. Cell cameras have basically expanded our visibility into ground that we can now cover. So whether that's permission property, suburban, whether it's leases, whether it's owning property in other states, whatever it is, the fact is the cell cameras have let us do that way more efficiently than we ever had. And, to your point, that's decreased access for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, you, you know, not picking on outfitters, but, you know, outfitters nowadays can lease out 10,000 acres and monitor that 10,000 acres in real time and say, well, Joe's going to this tree stand. Not just outfitters, us individuals. Yeah, we, we can buy a property in Illinois. Lee can go out to Kansas and put his cell cameras Absolutely. and then... Um, and we know, we know when to go. Hey, we're, we're monitoring you know. it. We're accessing We have it all right there. And so that has... That has put more land into fewer hunters' hands yeah. in the last five years. Definitely. Which, so that's what's funny is because we talk about it all the time where, and I'm sure you see this, Lee, it seems like every damn property in the United States is being hunted, right? Like every property, somebody's hunting this one, somebody's hunting this one, somebody's hunting this one. And, which is weird because there's less hunters, mm-hmm. right? So it's because there are those less hunters are able to monitor uh, and, and essentially Boy, virtually hunt more land. The states are really struggling to put their finger on that issue too. When we, when we call it out and say, you know, Hey, we're having some real issues here with access. They're like, well, I don't know what to tell you. Like we've got less hunters than ever before. I'm like, 
Okay, here's why. And they're like, well, we can't get rid of that because then we'll lose more hunters. I'm like, okay, well, we're losing hunters to begin with. And it's like, so where are we going here? <laughs> so what, that's why you see, I think, well, um, you know, Kansas had been the most notably on, on banning cameras on public land. Mm -hmm. Kentucky just released laws that I don't know if it's passed or not, but it will ban cellular cameras on any public land in the state of Kentucky. So, you know, it, it immediately, and I, I guarantee that it's having an impact. I mean, we saw it in Kansas. It was like, okay, we had no idea what was out there, Yeah, you know, and it was great. A giant buck pops up behind me and I'm like, whoa, yeah. where, where'd this thing come? Yeah. So, I mean, other people, it will start to relieve the pressure on public lands because people can't yep. have cell cameras all over the place monitoring that ground. Yep, it will. Yeah, the, the reason I bring it up is <clears throat> I know it's just such a hot topic right now. And I think these conversations are like really healthy to have. I think the second we stop talking about this stuff is when it just gets real stagnant and just, you yeah, know, I, I think it's good to like unpack this stuff. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, similar to like on the fishing side, I know, Jerry, you said you don't fish, but like live scope is also oh, I mean, I fish, uh, I an extreme. <laughs> yeah. Say what? I do fish. I'm yeah. just not. I'm too I, busy hunting. Frankly, I love my lives. Jeremy does a lot of but fishing. But it is it is yeah. absolutely turned the fishing world upside down. Yeah, literally. I would say it's it's a similar sort of dynamic, like live scope on the fishing side. Yeah. I've seen that cell comparison. cams on the hunting mm -hmm. side. There's been lots of discussions to be had. <laughs> I think it's all good to be you know kind of out and talking about it. And you know, I uh, I'm again like sort of in the middle ground here, like. It's kind of funny. Like I saw Jared, I think I told you this, but I saw a, uh, a Facebook comment of a, a, a guy that I know, like we're kind of loosely buddies. They were like in some debate on a Facebook forum and they're like, well, the reason that like, you know, Lee's able to, to kill these deer every year is because, you know, at the drop of a, he has the time, like at the drop of a hat, he can, you know, drive somewhere and be there that day or that next day. And he's using cell cameras. And it's like, that's, that's why he's able to kill these deer. And like, some people were like, you know, kind of defending me in a sense, but like, he's right. Like he's, he's a hundred percent right. Sure. Like, yeah, sure. I How else are you supposed to know that he's every there? day. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, no, he's, he's wow. right. Like, and, well, and so I here's, here's the position Lee, we day. have to take for like, you know, cause guys are like, they interpret when I say stuff like that, they're like, well, we can't bash so and so for this. And I'm like, listen, I'm not bashing anybody. I think everybody should hunt within their legal means in the most effective way that you can. And so if the state says you can use crossbows, yeah, you, know, you freaking should use them. If the state says you can use cell cameras and corn piles, that's how you're going to freaking kill them. So you better. I We lean more towards holding the state responsible for managing the resource. I can't expect an individual. I, I mean, yes, amongst groups of friends, I would say, come on, dude, like that's not fair. Sure. But I, yeah, I hold the state responsible for managing the resource i think and that's why we have conversations with guys like mike rex and you know it's, it's their responsibility yeah but they, and would, they're gonna I take our input on, so. sorry i would definitely lean on the state's understanding as well and mm -hmm. you know my my point is kind of like saying that, that he's right is that like i'm not i always try to be as like truthful and transparent as possible and i'm never trying to like sure. make myself be or, or paint myself in a different way than what i am it's like, yeah, I use cell cameras all the time. And that real time information is impossible to beat. Yep. yep. And That's so it. I guess <clears throat> in my own head, I'm sort of like, I got to formulate a line personally because it is legal. I think it's up to the States to, to determine, you know, those certain things, but like, you know, my internal kind of moral compass is what is kind of determining like the do's and don'ts. Like for example, if I was on a farm and, you know, I'm hunting in a, one stand and I get a cell camera picture of a buck on like this other side of the farm, like to me, I don't think I would like jump down the mule, race to the other side of the farm and try to hunt that deer. I think I would use I that information. You're an idiot. And yeah. Try to make <laughs> Are you kidding me? Like deer. I, I, know, right. I say yeah. that playfully because I know exactly what you mean, but like you'd be an idiot. Like, dude, we're spending so much time and resources to try to kill these things. It's not your fault that cell cameras are legal. Do I think that there's a line there that, you know, should be addressed by whether it's the states or us as a hunting community in general? Yeah, I don't think that's right that we should be able to do that. But it's legal. You're an idiot for not getting down and go killing that deer. 
And, and I'm not saying that I necessarily would not do that. I'm just saying like, I'm trying to consider I get it. I in get my it. mind, what is, what is fair chase? Like, you know, yeah. I just don't, as technology advances and stuff like that, like there's inevitably going to be lines that get crossed at some point. Well, did you're hundred percent so, right. And I'll point the finger like, so back at me in the state of Ohio, we talk about the baiting thing all the time. Like I'd be an idiot not to use corn piles. Cause like, guess what? That's where they're at. And so morally, ethically, like from a sportsmanship standpoint, I don't really want to, I don't really, you know, I share kind of your perspective you shared earlier. It's not, it's not what I want to do, but you're missing out. It's the same thing as not getting down from the, and going over with a cell cam sent you the picture. Like from, from, from mm -hmm. that kind of standpoint, it's legal and it's what kills deer. So you better do it. Yeah. And like I said, I use cell cameras. <clears throat> I mean, I use a bunch of them. I use all kinds of different cell cameras. Yeah, us too. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, a, and it's a huge tool. And another way to look at it, another question is like, you know, for example, on public land, if you have people that have made one trip in, they put a cell camera out, you're reducing pressure in those woods by that person not having to walk back in there and check that camera. They're right. kind of knowing what's going on. So like, are, are you, are you reducing the intrusion to a pu to public land for people not having to check these cameras or is it actually causing more intrusion because people are getting pictures and it's making them go out and hunt more in that place. Like, I, I just don't know. I, like I know. said, I think it is all a good, healthy conversation to have. Uh, yeah. To me, like I love using cell cameras because it minimizes your presence. And <clears throat> I always try to maximize sits. Having that real time information is impossible to beat. I will also say this though. And Jared, you and I talked about this for a second, but like, I wish, I wish I could go back to the day when you had to pull individual cards and stick them in a computer mm -hmm. and sit there and look at all these pictures because it's like, I, I remember that feeling. Of oh yeah. I know that, that I didn't, I didn't do, I wouldn't even look at anybody. I'm like, I have cards in my pocket. I'm going straight to the computer. Mom's like, hey, it's time for dinner. I'm like, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah get out of my way. <laughs> yeah. It's like that anticipation of you've had this camera out for a week you know, you're going to go pull the card and scroll through the pictures and see what happens. Like, I remember that, that yeah. feeling. And it, it was like such a, just, you know, it's like Christmas a great every feeling. day. It's and, so tough, man. I like yeah, there, there, are, you're it every day, so. there are ways that you could do it. And like, we're the last people to advocate for more. Whatever. Well, that's what Rules, I was going to ask. Like, what do you, Lee, what if, if by some reason cell cameras were banned, what, what do you think would happen? What do you, what do you think people would do? What would hunting look like? I think that, uh, well, I mean, that's, that's a pretty broad <laughs> question, but like, I think, I think if cell cameras were eliminated, uh, I think it would almost be like taking a step back in time. It would. Cause you are going, you, you're going back to the, everyone's pulling out their laptops again, pulling the cards, swapping cards and having these massive SD card, you know, dumps and going through all the pictures, which. That was always a really fun part of it to me, but do you um, think people? Well, you can do that. that. You okay. can do that. I guess where I was kind of going is you, you, you know, again, not for laws, right? But just for fun, for yep. say, now, you know, what if cell cam companies could only push cameras once a month? You know what I mean? It's it mm -hmm. still achieves the thing. You're like, okay, I now I only have to go in once. I don't, have, you know, I have to put pressure on it. I don't have the real time information to get down from my stand and go make sure. this other decision. It's once a month. I just there, there's there it is. There's your batch. There's my batch. Yeah. Nope. Yeah, I, I just I think the cat's out of the bag. It is, and it's it's such a useful tool. Like I, I I've used them a lot for going into my stand and checking to make sure the coast is clear. Like, oh, yeah. you know, there there was a couple times this year that deer that I was hunting I told you about that I'm now passing. There was two different times this year where it's like twelve thirty in the afternoon, one o'clock, which for here's early to be getting in a stand. Yeah, and I checked my camera and if I hadn't checked the camera before I went and walked in, I would have bumped the deer and blown him out. Yep. And it's like, because I was able to check the camera, I was like, Oh, he's in there. And we ended up not hunting that night. Cause it's like, he's already in there. Well, you know, we, we'd bump him out. Lee, let's also be honest, dude, how much sketchy shit are you getting on these cameras in the cities? A lot. <laughs> a lot. I like that That's might be just as entertaining as what you get from a big buck side. Uh, yeah, I could, I could, <laughs> We could do a whole episode on just what we've seen in our trail camps. And honestly, that's probably a pretty you good You thought Nick and the deer cooler idea. was weird. Yeah. 
I mean, ha- ha- let's put it this way. Have you ever had to turn anything over to cops? Not yet, no. Hey, I've hey, seen hey, a cop's hey. uh I've seen a cop's dick this year on camera. Oh nice. Wow. Just One of your cameras? <laughs> One of my cameras, I, he didn't know it was there, walked onto my property. I don't know what they were doing. Walked right out. You just didn't see the hooker out, behind him. <laughs> yep. I I got- mean, dude, my camera was on video mode. Oh, so, wow. like, it's not pictures, it's video. Wow. Walks wow. right in front of the camera, flops it out, takes a piss, keeps on walking. Never right. knew the camera was there. He's like, like, I'm not, I'm not see- even mad. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Uh, <laughs> I had I had a dude uh, yeah. drop a deuce right in front of our stand. I, it wasn't on video mode. I had, I, but it was you know Multiple it was it was a, it was a scrape, so it was triggering quick. Yeah, it was three, a burst. We're talking three picture bursts, you know, <laughs> two three second delay, and uh, did yeah. you actually lay eyes on his turd? On what? <laughs> did you actually lay eyes on his turd? Uh oh yeah yeah there yeah there, there was, was hot snakes. There was turd sure. coming out. There was balloon knot and everything. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was that bad oh the full deal yeah full deal yeah, it was pretty rough i had a guy i had a guy uh <laughs> it was a construction worker this year squatted in front of my camera the whole series of pictures and like he sits down like cheeks facing the camera and stuff oh, no. and like yeah i mean the whole you, you saw everything it was it was bad oh, and I mean- then the, the, funniest part, the funniest part was he turned around i guess to wipe and then saw the camera oh. and then it started it, he has this just grin on his face, just like waving at the camera. I'm like, yeah, you got uh, it. No. I mean, dude, in like major rural areas, I still kind of do the double check yeah, you just, gotta look. just to make sure. There's a, one of the most bizarre, well, when I was hunting in Ohio in this like really sketchy area, I, <laughs> I've got a large camera album of ridiculous things, but one of the more like cr- just absurd things was two well two things one there was a guy in a full inflatable chicken costume on my buddy's camera up there (laughs) in the middle of a farm it's not like this was by a neighborhood it wasn't even around halloween this was like november this this guy in a full like chicken costume walks up like starts waddling like shakes his little chicken butt in the camera and it's like he's in the middle of 600 acres so we had no idea where this guy came from. It wasn't anybody. He don't. Nobody had, knows where this be, guy's camera was. It had was, to be intentional. Like right, right. He knew the camera was there. Had to have. He knew the camera was there, but I don't know how the guy got there. Like he was wandering in the middle of the six hundred acres in a chicken costume. Uh, it sounds like, like that, that. Sounds like a plan. Incredible. Sounds like he brought it with him, put it on within, and then wa- and was putting on a show for you. I don't know. I. I was gonna say. One, it was that's, either that's him or I'm talking about. it was the Creek Kings guy. That's yes, that's the video I'm talking about. It wasn't their video; it was our buddy's video. But uh, we're all in that same friend group. Oh, uh, whoa! Wow! Yeah, I was like, <laughs> "This is deja vu." I was trying to think. I was like, "Who said that before?" To that's us? funny. I was hearing it for the first time. Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> I must have glazed over the first time. I do remember now. Oh, dude, we get a lot of people. We get a lot of people that. Uh, I don't know what it is, but like people around suburban areas, they like to walk the woods naked. Yeah, mm, sure. Who so like Understandable. Get, yeah, it's not. It's just you know, there's more of them airing it out. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's probably pretty fun. I might need to try it myself sometime. But yeah, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, we have several different occurrences where like it's always big, like bigger adult males, like fat guys mm, yeah. that it's- are butt naked. <laughs> And just want to go frolic in the woods for like 30 minutes. It's, and a, it's, always a, it's a dad move. Yeah, that. it runs in the family. Yeah. My, I don't live in a rural area. My my neighbors, man, if they've got any sort of surveillance, they've got me. Yeah. Yeah. Runs in the family. You know? like, uh, Walk out on the deck. I've got a, I've got a, uh, uh, my ice bath yeah. and my sauna and stuff is outside. So, yeah, I'm outside frequently in the nude. It's That's... nice. It's nice. <laughs> oh, I've my seen, God. Uh, I've seen some pretty ridiculous things from the stand over the years in suburban area. I mean, I'm sure there's some some places where you're walking in in the morning in the dark and you're like, this is this could be sketchy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've watched two people um, have sex before. 
Me too. Uh, on TV. Like oh. a down. <laughs> wow. It was like a rainstorm. They wandered in the woods, started getting it on, and I'm in the tree, like you know, saying hey and waving and stuff. But it's like so loud with the pouring rain. They just wow. I, I eventually just got on and left. But, That's a regular um, like notebook story there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dreamy. That's so romantic. <laughs> yeah. Let's do it in the rain. Yeah. Uh, uh, lots of stuff like that. that's wild man sketch sketchy stuff and in, in suburban america yeah so mm-hmm. well cool i know yeah. we, we got a lot more to cover we'll save it for the next one and uh i know jeremy you got to run so we'll, we'll wrap it up yep well we appreciate coming on dude thanks for for chiming in and and talking with us a bit it's been yeah. a long time coming i think yeah thanks for getting back to us man i uh it's funny how these kind of things go about it's like I, i'm sure you guys I'm sure you guys get bombarded with messages and stuff too, but I have no other way of contacting you. So I wrote you on Instagram and then you happened to follow up, like whatever it was, like six months later or something, we were in Illinois. I was like, what well, can we just write me back? <laughs> and uh, yeah, we made it happen. So there you go. I think it was like one of y'all, one of y'all's posts maybe popped up or something. And I uh, like, I don't know. I went to send y'all a message and saw you'd already sent me one. I don't know what it was, but yeah. Sorry, it took a minute. To- no, oh, sorry. Right. Well, you got my cell phone number now. So it's deer that's season. The, that's the way. We're all kind of foggy at this point in the deer season. Yeah. It's going to be January in like two weeks. Well, listen to this. <laughs> hey, like, man, I've got, a, I got a no sh- shooter showed up last night. So I'm, go. I've got some optimism for my Ohio tag. Lee's going to be going and getting cameras rolling. Heck yeah. So we'll hang out here for a minute after we, you know, kind of say our goodbyes here and we'll, uh, we'll see you off. But yeah, appreciate you joining us, man. It's been fun. And until uh, next time. Yep. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Muddy. Man, Jared, we probably have been using Muddy products for at least 10 years now. It's a long time, dude. It's been a long time. And I can remember when it was simply just safety harnesses and camera arms of all things. And, you know, that's evolved to where you and I both have a bunch of Muddy box blinds as well. I wouldn't say a bunch. But, yeah, they, they've come a long way. And certainly the box blinds are, are huge. Shot that buck of your shoulder out of a Muddy box blind a couple years ago. The harness and, and all of the other safety accessories really are, are a major component of, of what Muddy offers for me. Um, you know, we've had some injuries in the past, you know, some, some tree stand accidents. This, this is all back before we were using, uh, you know, frankly, harnesses, mm-hmm. uh, the lineman's belt while we're hanging stuff, and the safe lines. I have those in every single one of, uh, you know, our fixed tree stands now. And uh, so we really have made safety a priority. Uh, that, that's a big deal for us. And, uh, you know, Muddy has everything we need for that. Yeah, and I think uh, the cool thing about Muddy is anyone listening to the Hunter podcast can save 20% using the code HUNTER20. That's H-U-N-T-R-2-0. Uh, anything that you can see on the Muddy Outdoors store online, use that code, save yourself 20% for this hunting season. Go Muddy. And awesome. Pretty cool. Yeah, man. It, awesome to talk to to Lee and, and really get a perspective on their stuff because, you know, I think a lot of people, uh, obviously a lot of people watch his content, but they don't understand kind of the behind the scenes of what those understand. guys have really, really gotten into. <laughs> well, dude, they're a, they're a big channel, so inevitably Huge. that comes with a lot of haters. <laughs> yeah, you know, and yeah. they're, they're, he's obviously com, you know conflicted with that. He's got they've got a big following, a big platform. They you know it's a small area too, so they're you know stepping on toes as far as permission, and and I think they're suffering some of the consequences of that as well. They've yeah, seems I mean, like he fully fully said like Drew was really struggling this year to get permission get on some permission, places yeah. and stuff. Yeah, it's that's the hardest part I think when you hear that is like inevitably like what they're doing is awesome and to his point like it was kind of controversial. Well, it's cool. For a while. It's, fun, it's fun to watch. It's like oh man, I didn't know that existed. But then just like a THP, it's like oh the shit, spotlight. We too. can go do this. We could, we could go on public and kill deer. Oh, we could go to suburban America and kill deer. And that inevitably is driving the force. You know, what? what's interesting is like, uh, again, we're losing hunter numbers, right? Supposedly. Mm-hmm. Uh, these things are getting more populated because they're becoming more aware. You would think there would be some fine balance there, right? To where like we're losing hunter numbers. So, yeah, they're driving more people in, but it's not that many more people. Um, but I don't know. You know, maybe it's because there's less land because there's development in these areas. I, I you know, yeah. just seems strange because, I mean, clearly they, they are seeing more pressure in these spaces. Oh, definitely. Well, and I mean, probably he's doing the same thing we did, right? Like home base was there and, it, yep. you know, whatever, you know, things change over time. So he's branching out, which is what you should do, you know, go, go to new areas, go to new states. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm, you know, I, I sympathize with those states, too, of like, hey, you just don't want to go everywhere and blow spots up and stuff, but. 
you know, spread your wings. Go go check stuff out. See what deer hunting is like outside of Atlanta. I'm glad he challenged us on the cell cam stuff because that's a cool discussion to continue to have. No right or wrong answer, really. I mean, they're legal. Use them. You know, mm-hmm. just like if baiting's legal, use it. Yeah. Um, well, and I was kind of blunt with him there, but it's like, dude, you're stupid. We're out here. <laughs> you're we're out here trying to kill these. The big goal deer. is to kill that. You thing. got a picture of it over by this. I mean, if that's the most direct. Uh, yeah, why sit here when he's there? What are you going to do? Not go sit there? Like, you're going to intentionally sabotage yourself? Th- those are the moral uh, predicaments that, you know, technology, and especially cell cameras, you know, give you the opportunity to make. And so, it's yeah, it's a, it's a fun question coming from him. Yeah. Yeah, well, especially because, like, a micro X was the most direct. I mean, he pointed out three specific cases where yeah. he's like, here's that how, deer died because of the happened. cell cam. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people doing it. And like I said, it's legal. Do it. You know, how you want, if you don't think that it's morally right, don't do it. Don't use them. Yeah. Like it's a pretty easy discussion, but yeah, cool. Cool to have that discussion with those guys and, and, you know, happy to, to see those guys really enjoying what they're doing and seeing the growth. I mean, you know, that's the, they're one of the OGs on the, on the YouTube side from a hunting content standpoint, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. Cool conversation. We'll have Leon in the future. I'm sure. Sounds good. Uh, well, we appreciate everybody listening to this episode of Hunter podcast. One sixty two. Dose. And with Lee Ellis from Seek One, and we'll catch y'all next week. Later. It's take me. Oh.